Did you know? Blastoise's water cannons are used to crush protests in Southeast Asia. Rattata are heavily armed thieves, and Nidorina cut the throats of their trainer's rivals? Well, if you grew up in Russia, you probably did know, but everyone else watching this video doesn't have a clue what we're talking about. These details and hundreds more bizarre descriptions were printed in a Russian Pokédex book published in 2001. We have the whole thing translated, and it's pretty hilarious. So we're going to read all 151 entries and show all the art, but first, we need about two minutes or so to explain the historical context here. Early Pokémon games were officially localized into six different languages, but kids in other countries weren't immune to Pokémon fever. So they either had to import and play in languages they couldn't understand, or settle for poorly translated pirated cartridges. One of those kids was Nastya Zhatinsky, a little Russian girl who loved Pokémon but couldn't find out much about them. So her father took it upon himself to study the franchise as best he could with the resources available to him, and write a Pokédex that children could read in their own language. This book was widely distributed throughout Russia in the early 2000s and has continued to be reprinted and sold even recently. So a lot of Pokemon fans in the world's biggest country grew up with their own very unique Pokédex that painted a completely different picture of what the first 151 Pokemon were all about. And frankly, about half of them are absolutely meme-worthy and definitely worth reading more than two decades later. It might not have been officially sanctioned by the Pokemon Company. In fact, the book's publisher ended up getting threatened with a lawsuit, but Russian kids back then didn't know that. So for them, this book was the Pokédex. Certainly a lot of kids must have realized it was fake, but some of them really believed Pokemon were a bunch of gang members robbing each other, terrorists overthrowing governments, cops locking them up, and journalists writing fake news. A lot of YouTubers obsess over the Japanese side of Pokemon, but today we're going to do something different and look at the Russian side of Pokemon. The story of this Pokédex was brought to our attention by Nintendo Russia employee Annette Ilvers, who's sort of their Pokemon specialist. The guy who put us in touch with Annette was Nob Ogasawara, who used to work for Nintendo and was the official English localizer for Pokemon Gens 1 through 4. Over the past eight months, Annette helped us get our hands on several editions of the Russian Pokédex, translate it into English, and double and triple check the entire translation. Although we should note that Annette didn't do this in an official capacity for Nintendo, it was all in her off hours as a fan who thinks the book's an important part of Pokémon history and worth preserving. She told us, By the time circulation got cut due to legal issues, many children already had it. I asked friends and even those who were not into Pokémon surprisingly still had it as a child. So let's crack this thing open. Before we get to the Pokédex itself, we'll read the book's preface, where the author, Alexander Shatinsky, writes, Dear friends, I wrote this book for my daughter Nastya and her friends. They're very fond of Pokémon and buy the figurines, stickers, toys, and even a small Pokémon radio. They also watch the Pokémon cartoon, but there's nowhere they can read about where Pokémon live, how they behave, or what they do. To find out, I met with many Pokémon, talked to them, studied the press, then I wrote this encyclopedia and asked the artist Dmitry Gorchev to draw Pokémon illustrations for it. Just like people, Pokémon are all different, good and evil, calm and chaotic, honest and utter liars. Just like us, they want to find happiness and don't know where to look. But they'll be pleased if this book helps you understand them better. And if it helps you understand humans better too, the artist and I will be pleased as well. And now for the Pokédex entries. The first couple aren't too bizarre, but they get pretty weird pretty quick. And it'll get even weirder the deeper we go. It begins, of course, with number one, Bulbasaur. It says, Bulbasaur are a cross between plants and animals. Green bulbs grow on their backs that open at night and bloom big, poisonous flowers. These are Bulbasaur's main weapon. If you sniff one, you'll die. That's why no one smells Bulbasaur. They also attack with sharp leaves. Bulbasaur likes sleeping in warm swamps. They feel at home there and eat water lilies. They're pretty stupid, but don't mean any harm. Other Pokemon treat Bulbasaur with sympathy, and their owners like to teach them useful skills, like cleaning rooms, because Bulbasaur are happy to serve as vacuum cleaners. Their voices are quiet, and their tempers are meek. They're also quite touchy. Eventually, they'll turn into Ivysaur, then into Venusaur. Number 2. Ivysaur if you feed a Bulbasaur mushrooms, it'll turn into Ivysaur. The buds on their backs are very beautiful, and they mostly live in forests and swamps. They get around by hopping, which makes a gross squelching sound. If you're trying to find an Ivysaur, just follow the gross noises. They're sentimental and usually pretty whiny. Ivysaur are smarter than Bulbasaur, but not by much. Several attempts were made to train Ivysaur for use in wedding ceremonies, but the brides were afraid of them. And every venture ended in failure. 
Recently, they've been getting invited as guests on the TV show To Help the Florist, where the hosts try to combine them with pineapples in front of a live studio audience. Ivysaur actually enjoys it, which proves how stupid they are. Number 3. Venusaur These massive Pokémon are helpful around the house, like carrying heavy objects and guarding the home. But their favorite thing is acting like a flower bed in the front yard. At the opening ceremony of the Seoul Olympics, 2,000 Venusaur formed a giant living bouquet in the middle of the soccer field. But don't be fooled, they're very fearsome in battle. Their favorite trick is jumping on their foes and flattening them with the weight of their 100 kilogram bodies. And they don't hesitate to poison, bite, and scratch them too. Venusaur are trustworthy and kind, giving their masters rides on their backs and letting them sit between the leaves of their flowers. But Venusaur erupt into rage as soon as they see an enemy, so be prepared. Venusaur will not show mercy. Number 4. Charmander Charmander is so cheerful and playful that they get careless with their tail flames. They light up anywhere, anytime, which causes wildfires. One time, a Charmander burned down a clothing store in Tokyo when accidentally brushing its tail against a wedding dress. Another fire happened in a bank when Charmander tried to light a cigarette for a security guard, but miscalculated the strength of its flame and set fire to the cash register. Three million dollars turned into ash. Charmander refuel by drinking one liter of gasoline per day. If there's not any gasoline available, they'll refuel with alcohol instead. But their tails don't burn as well with alcohol, and Charmander gets really drunk and stumbles around. Number 5. Charmeleon Charmeleon are much more dangerous than Charmander, and their tails burn like a welding torch. Which is why they're often employed by welding companies. A couple years ago, a team of 20 Charmeleon cut the USS Missouri battleship into pieces so it could go to the smelter. Charmeleon are great against Ice-type Pokémon, but powerless against Water-types, since water can extinguish their tail flames. Charmeleon also serve as lamps in small towns as a replacement for streetlights. They also make good movie actors, cooks, and policemen. Well, until they turn into Charizard, the Flying Terror. Number 6. Charizard Charizard, who people call the Flying Terror, are notable for their ferocity and extraordinary gluttony. When their bellies are full, they can't fly anymore and just wander around, waddling from side to side. That's a good time to try and catch one with a net. Charizard are kept in fireproof cages. Before they're set free, Charizard are given gas cans to drink, but they can explode from a single spark, so it's dangerous to smoke around a gas-filled Charizard. Charizard serve as watchmen for television towers and skyscrapers, but you have to be careful. The Austin Kino television tower in Moscow burned down from the flames of the Charizard guarding it. So nowadays, it's guarded by Zubat and Golbat. Number 7. Squirtle Cute little Squirtles are usually handled by beginner trainers, but they're hard to train because they don't have ears, so they can't hear their master's orders. Squirtles' diet consists of earthworms and tadpoles that they catch in ponds. They're so peaceful that it's hard to believe that they eventually become ferocious war turtle and blastoise. Squirtles do not bite because they don't have teeth. They like doing puzzles and crosswords, taking pictures, and they especially like watching TV and lying on the bottom of aquariums, looking through the thick glass with their round, shiny eyes. Squirtle's voices are hoarse and rough, which hints at the antisocial behavior that they exhibit later in life. Number 8. Wartortle As soon as Squirtle grows ears, it turns into Wartortle, a creature of a completely different character, behavior, and even education. Wartortles are cocky, vicious, and even vengeful. There's always one or two war turtle at every street fight. Then the police get involved, then court, then prison. Every single war turtle is registered with the police, and half of them wind up in jail for hooliganism. Still, these quick-witted and daring Pokémon are fun to have around. They're great swimmers and skilled with a wide variety of firearms. Don't be surprised if you see war turtle attacking their own masters. They're really quite nasty little creatures. Number nine. Blastoise. Eventually, War Turtle turn into Blastoise, disgusting predators with the height and weight of a man. Blastoise's main weapons are the water cannons on their backs that shoot water like fire hoses. For this reason, Blastoise are often used to disperse protesters in Southeast Asian countries. In Europe, they're used to water lawns, but they need to be fed on time, otherwise hungry Blastoise can kill the entire population of a small town. When they're not working or committing atrocities, Blastoise read magazines and newspapers and like car races and paintball. They also love dumplings filled with cabbage. Number 10. Caterpie These cucumber-sized caterpillars are the most useless Pokémon. Caterpie can't fly, can't swim, can't run, can't shoot, and can't spit fire. All they can do is crawl. But it'd be a mistake to think they're completely useless. They have thoughts rolling around in their heads that are sometimes quite sensible and unexpected. 
One time, a Caterpie startled the Pokemon community with a simple question. It went on TV and asked, why do we exist? Then it answered its own question. It said, there is no reason. Then it crawled away to eat fern leaves. Caterpie are very thoughtful. They're friends with singing teachers, plumbers, and soldiers who got drafted. They ask Caterpie how to live, and it tells them. Caterpie gives different advice to everyone, and that's why they actually do have some value. Number 11, Metapod. In wintertime, Caterpie roll up into big green bags and turn into Metapod. They only retain their eyes and a small nose, although they lose their nostrils. Metapod don't eat or even breathe. They just sit there thinking and waiting to become butterfree. Experienced trainers hang groups of Metapods over stoves and radiators so they ripen faster. Unfortunately, it's quite painful for Metapod. They sweat and suffer, you can see it in their eyes. It's best to put a Metapod under your bed and forget about it until spring. Then, on the first sunny spring day, you'll suddenly see a big butterfree the size of a TV jump out and flop down on the windowsill, basking in the sunlight. Number 12, Butterfree. Butterfree have very hard wings, which they use to beat small animals to death, like rabbits and goats, for example. But these butterflies are rarely used for battling. Instead, they're mostly employed as mailmen. Butterfree can be found in the finest homes of California, where they're fashionable to use as fans. Rich people have flocks of Butterfree in their houses and arrange them in circles in their living rooms to blow fresh, cool air on their guests. The most intelligent Butterfree can parrot commercials they see on TV. Made wisely, don't wait, grab a Snickers. Russia, the generous soul, they sing, flying around the mansions of millionaires and Hollywood movie actors. By the way, uh, these popular slogans were from Russian commercials back when this Pokédex was written, so now it makes sense. Number 13, Weedle. Another type of Caterpillar Pokemon, Weedle, are very different from Caterpie in their mobility, determination, and arrogance. Weedle are fast as bicycles when they're chasing mice. Then it puts the mouse in a shoebox but doesn't eat it. Weedle mostly eat fried potatoes and green peas. They're poisonous and if they bite you, it won't heal for a long time. It's strong enough to kill small birds and animals. To become Kakuna, Weedle have to take a warm shower and drink a glass of milk while listening to relaxing music. So if you see a Weedle looking for milk in the fridge, you should know it'll become a Kakuna soon and won't bother you for a while. Number 14, Kakuna. Kakuna are 10 kilogram chrysalises who are completely motionless and look like they're dead. They're also covered in hard shells that protect them from predators. The fields of the Chinese Xinjiang province are littered with Kakuna. Peasants collect Kakuna to make Kakukala, a healing drink that soothes stomach aches. And they also make buttons and jewelry out of their shells. You have to be careful in July when Kakuna turn into evil Beedrill. It happens as a sudden explosion. The shells burst and a hungry Beedrill crawls out with a terrible howl. If you can't immediately smash it with a shovel, you need to run inside or jump into the nearest river. Number 15, Beedrill. Beedrill can drill holes through tank armor, factory smokestacks, asphalt, and even icebergs. They don't care where, they just like drilling. The needles on their front paws aren't just drills, they also use them as syringes to inject poison. When an angry Beedrill rushes at an enemy, it makes a disgusting buzzing sound, similar to the squeal of an electric saw. When that happens, try to make sure the enemy isn't you. Beedrill's thin neck is its weak spot. You can easily tear its head right off its bodies by using both hands to yank its antenna. If you can do that before Beedrill delivers a fatal injection, you win. If not, you lose. Number 16, Pidgey. Pidgey look like a cross between sparrows and parrots. They fly in packs and scream loudly. Team Rocket keeps a large flock for scouting, using them to report where Pikachu, Arcanine, and other valuable Pokemon can be found. Pidgey eat millet, waffles, and cookies. They can peck a small mouse to death, but generally speaking, they're cowardly and traitorous. Pidgey are so stupid, it's become an expression. Stupid as a Pidgey is what other Pokemon say. Most Pidgey are journalists and businessmen. When more than three of them get together, you need to plug your ears with cotton and crawl quietly to the other end of the field, forest, lake, or wherever you happen to be. Better yet, just call a Charizard who can swallow an entire pack of these adorably cute Pokemon in one massive bite. Number 17, Pidgeotto. The most impressive Pidgey turn into Pidgeotto. They're usually used to fight Ekans, who are Pidgey's biggest rival. Whole flocks of Pidgeotto track down Ekans, pull them out of their holes, then carry them high into the sky and let go so they fall to the ground. 
It takes two dozen Pidgeotto to catch one Ekans. These Pokemon are very arrogant. They think they're very beautiful, and it's difficult to convince them otherwise. They love to fly in flocks over the smooth surface of a lake, admiring their own reflections. Sometimes it costs Pidgeotto its life when it's focused on its reflections, then crashes headfirst into a cliffside and dies in terrible agony. Several Pidgeotto are United States congressmen. Number 18, Pidgeot. Even though they come from Pidgeotto, Pidgeot have completely different personalities. They're quiet, reserved, and don't like society. Usually they sit on road signs all alone and drivers ask them for advice like, how do I get to Paris? And they squawk, I don't know, leave me alone. The drivers try to feed Pidgeot cheese and meat pate, but they're very proud creatures who refuse to eat out of people's hands. Notable Pidgeot include one rider, two clowns, and seven hairdressers who live all around the world. Sometimes hunters shoot Pidgeot because they make for easy targets when they're sitting on poles and road signs. Number 19, Rattata. Rattata are young cat-sized rats with very sharp teeth. They can bite through thick books or the sole of a boot. More than anything, they love dancing at techno nightclubs. Usually about 300 Rattata show up and dance till they drop. After they wear themselves out, predatory Pharaohs swoop in and gobble them up with their long beaks. Rattata make for good friends. They like to climb on their master's knee and sit there snoring. They'll eat anything, gnawing on books, boots, dishes, closets, and chairs. And they especially love money. If you've lost any money, you should know it was probably a Rattata who stole it. Some have managed to squirrel away as much as $15,000 in their holes. Number 20, Raticate. Raticate are only slightly bigger than Rattata, but much heavier. Imagine an 80 kilogram fluff ball with sharp teeth and a long tail. That's Raticate. With a running start, they can break through brick walls. Raticate's main occupation is unloading wagons with washing powder, toothpaste, and deodorants. 150 Raticate can unload a wagon in a single hour. But you should never hire them to unload wagons of food. They'll gobble up every last crumb. In wintertime, Raticate hide in deep holes and eat their stashes of cereal and crackers. Sometimes they fight to get back stolen dollars from their Rattata relatives to buy themselves their favorite food, which is yogurt. Number 21, Spiro. Spiro are like Pidgey, except they're even dumber. But they make up for their stupidity by being extra cruel. Despite their small size, one Spiro can easily peck a sheep to death. They usually win in fights against Pidgey, but they don't fight to the death because they secretly love each other. After the fight, they drink Fanta and sing songs. Some people train their Spiros for no-holds-barred cockfights. They toss two Spiro into a big cage where they peck at each other, feathers flying everywhere. Spectators throw down bets on who they think will win, but it's all a scam. The fights are usually fixed and afterwards the owners split the profits. Spiro's most hated enemies are Nidoran, Nidoqueen, and Nidoking. They can't defeat them in battle, but they do lots of dirty tricks like crapping on their heads. Number 22, Firo. Firo hover in the sky for long periods of time searching for prey, then swoop down and snatch them with their sharp talons. They live in mountain caves and rock cliffs, and their long beaks are sharp enough to impale a small calf. Firo eggs weigh 5 kilograms, and the shells are so thick that Firos and their babies can't even break them. So a mother Firo grabs the egg with her feet and throws it off a cliff down onto the sharp rocks below. Then, the egg breaks and a baby Spiro pops out. Firo live a very long time. Maybe forever. No one knows for sure because there's never been a recorded case of one dying of old age. They've died in battles to be sure, but not of old age or disease. Number 23. Ekans. Ekans are quiet long killers who live in deep holes. Their burrows have two exits because when Ekans slithers inside, they can't turn around and have to crawl out from the other end. They feed on Firo and Pidgeotto eggs. Ekans keep their own eggs underground and only bring them out once a year during Easter. They lay them out on the grass and paint them different colors using their tails like paintbrushes. Ekans saw this Christian custom on TV and adopted it as their own. Ekans' spit is deadly and their bites are instantly fatal. Their tails have sharp stingers, which are also poisonous. In short, they're very dangerous fighters. In civilian life, they like to read books about history and philosophy, turning every page with their tail. Number 24, Arbok. Arbok are giant serpents who weigh almost half a ton and are as long as buses. They use poison and bright beams of light to paralyze their enemies. When they do that, they hiss and remain completely still. After their victims die of fear, Arbok swallow them whole. They could swallow a whole cow if they wanted to. Their only weakness is that they slither very slowly. Arbok can only slither a distance of its own body length per hour. 
fearless Arbok hunters sneak up behind them and bash their heads with clubs, stunning them, then shove Arbok into a metal pipe and roll it away. But if a hunter fails to stun Arbok, he usually gets strangled to death. Number 25, Pikachu. Pikachu are cheerful and very famous. They're known all over the world and presidents and kings come to meet them, but their owners love them for other reasons as well. Pikachu is the most famous electric Pokemon. Their tails produce shocks like the naked wires of a transformer. Sparks fly and fires flare. Some of them can even make thunderstorms. You can charge a Pikachu with ordinary batteries which last for a week. When the charge runs out, Pikachu gets lazy and irritable, crying a lot and wiping away their tears. After a Pikachu gets some new batteries, it'll bounce up like a ball and sing songs. They love singing on stage and shooting small lightning bolts at the audience. Number 26, Raichu. Here's a little translation note for you. The symbol on Raichu's belly says, do not touch deadly, a standard electric shock warning on Russian transformer boxes. Anyways, okay, here's the Pokedex entry. If you replace a Pikachu's batteries with a 220 volt power source, it'll turn into Raichu, a powerful electric fighter who can strike with lightning at a distance of 20 meters. Raichu often serve as power plants in rural areas. They're charged once a month and sent on buses to rural transformer stations where their paws are attached to wires. Dealing with them is a dangerous job that only specialists in rubber boots can do. A single Raichu can charge a TV, a refrigerator, a washing machine, and an iron. But you should never connect Christmas tree lights to Raichu. They might just burn out. In general, be careful. If you're gonna play with Raichu, make sure to wear rubber gloves and boots. Number 27, Sandshrew. Sandshrew are heavy and dumb. Only two or three of them know the multiplication table, and the rest can't even count the claws on their own paws, even though they only have two. Sandshrew are covered with scales similar to floor tiles. When they move, the scales make an awful crunching sound. But if you listen for the crunching, you can figure out where they're hiding and catch one. Sandshrew are one of the few species of Pokemon you can eat. They taste like crab meat and highly prized in Japanese restaurants. Professor Oak is an activist who leads the fight against the barbaric custom of hunting Sandshrew. Despite their stupidity, many Sandshrew are good at directing traffic and use their tails as signposts and their eyes as traffic lights. Number 28. Sandslash. Sandslash are like hedgehogs, but much bigger. And those aren't needles on their back, they're scales. When they're in danger, like getting chased by a Nidoking, they curl into a ball and roll down the road. When that happens, be careful. There were a few times a rolling sandslash flattened an entire company of cadets on their way to a steam bath. They like to eat peanuts, sugarless orbit gum, and Tide washing powder? It's really hot in Madagascar, so Sandslash who live there have scales made of paper. In the springtime, they shed their scales and stay naked all summer. When they're naked and vulnerable, they're often preyed upon by Nidoqueen and Nidoking, fearsome jungle unicorns who catch Sandslash and devour them to the last bone. And sometimes they eat their trainers too. Number 29, Nidoran Female. Unlike other Pokemon, the Nidoran family are divided into males and females. The small and pretty female Nidoran are quite rare and have poisonous teeth. They strike up conversations, flirt, and give provocative looks, then suddenly pounce on their chatting partner and bite their neck. Nidoran likes to eat cakes, sweets, and lipstick, and love flowers and perfumes. They only read fashion magazines and watch TV, and they love to daydream. You should always be careful around these charming females, though. They're not just toxic, but also huge liars. A few Nidoran work as TV presenters, but more commonly employed as department store clerks. Number 30, Nidorina. After maturing, Nidoran turns into Nidorina, evil and grumpy creatures who bite and scratch. They're always mad about something, irritable and always criticizing the government of the countries they live in, as well as all other governments. But in spite of that, they're actually quite useful around the house. They like growing tomatoes and cucumbers and selling them at the vegetable market. They often read newspapers and go to protests and demonstrations. Trainers can easily tame their Nidorina by giving them fake jewelry, rings, earrings, and pendants that Nidorina wear on holidays or when they go to protests. Nidorina are loyal to those trainers till death and happy to cut the throats of their rivals. They're very caring. Number 31, Nidoqueen. Some especially vicious Nidorina turn into Nidoqueen, who are as tall as ceilings and heavy as cows. They're the queens of the Nitto family, and despite their weight, they're very agile and dance beautifully, waving their thick tails around. But it's not a good idea to approach one when she's dancing. One time at a party, an overenthusiastic Nitto queen crippled 17 teenagers with her tail. Nitto queen likes to drink, especially champagne with gin and tonic. Some of them smoke pipes. After a Nitto queen's been tamed with gin and tonic, you can use her to carry food and water, agricultural work, and removing pavements from roads, which they break open with their tails. They make for good mothers and grandmothers. Number 32, 
Nidoran male. Nidoran are the males of the Nidoran family, although they don't really deserve that title. Small, suspicious, and cautious, they don't trust anyone and always hide behind rocks, sticking out their huge ears to listen for danger. Nidoran are convinced everyone's out to get them, even though for the most part, no one cares about them. Even female Nidoran prefer Charmeleon, romantically speaking. Nidoran have actually grown pretty bitter about that fact and dig their horns in the ground with impotent rage. They often work as journalists writing about new video rentals, books, and theatrical productions. Their articles are cleverly written but filled with pessimism. If a male Nidoran ever manages to pull a female Nidoran, the two make a great married couple. Number 33, Nidorino. Nidorino like being bachelors, eating delicious food, and watching soccer on TV. They also love singing folk songs, but it's best not to listen because they don't have any musical talent whatsoever. Nidorino make for good friends and great conversationalists on any topic, although they're most knowledgeable about sports, food, and politics. They attack suddenly, like all Pokemon of the Nidoran family do. If you're talking to one and let your guard down, he'll pounce on you, bite, trample, scratch, and stab you with his horn. But they're also forgiving. Their fits of rage last no more than 15 or 20 minutes. And after that, you can go back to hanging out peacefully. If you're still alive, that is. A lot of them work in the military to attack enemies. Number 34, Nidoking. Huge as hippos and tall as trees, Nidoking are the kings of battling Pokemon and capable of spreading terror among civilian populations and the police. As their heavy stomps echo through the streets of a sleeping town, the residents hide under their beds and pray to God for salvation. Nato King can demolish two-story houses with their tails. They feed on domestic geese and chickens, devouring them by the dozen feathers and all. They swear incessantly, but their language is unintelligible. However, a skilled trainer like Ash knows how to make these Pokemon docile and even affectionate. You just need to scratch their bellies with a special wooden comb similar to a rake. That makes Nato King purr and roll over on his back and wiggle his paws up in the air. Number 35, Clefairy. Clefairy are rare and harmless Pokemon who live in steppes and deserts, where they roll long distances in the wind like tumbleweeds. No one knows what Clefairies eat, or for that matter, why they even exist. Some scientists believe they're actually space dust that fell to Earth and populated the deserts. It's quite a beautiful sight to see a huge herd of Clefairy cross the Arabian desert. Looking down from a helicopter, they look like a living pink carpet pushed by the wind, flowing slowly over the sands. Bedouins riding camels chase them down and catch them, dry them out, and sell them to foreign tourists as souvenirs. Clefairies know how to imitate birds, TVs, and tape recorders, but they're very unhappy in their personal lives. Number 36, Clefable. Clefable aren't much heavier than Clefairy, so they have to use their little legs to walk since the wind isn't strong enough to carry them. They eat mollusks and insects and drink beer. Clefable's bodies are very bouncy, and when they fall, they bounce off the ground like balls. That peculiar trait is why you'll often see them at the circus, working in small troops, jumping and flipping around on wooden boards. Clefables communicate with ease and are skilled at learning foreign languages, which allows them to work as tour guides in Italy, Spain, and Portugal. There are hardly any Clefable in the northern countries because it's cold up there and Clefable doesn't have any fur to keep them warm. Clefable are all religious. Most are Buddhists, but some are Catholics. Number 37. Vulpix. Vulpix are little horses with fiery tails, slightly reminiscent of the hump-backed horse, but more dangerous. Vulpix are amateur terrorists who use their sense of smell to find fuel tanks, weapon warehouses, and if they can't find anything better, firework stands. Then, Vulpix sets them on fire. They're not pursuing any commercial or political interests, they just like seeing fire and explosions. Only Blastoise with their water cans can fight Vulpix, but unfortunately, Blastoise are quite clumsy and Vulpix run circles around them, overjoyed at the prospect of starting fires. They also love children and setting fireworks off for them. Number 38, Ninetales. Ninetales are horses who can fly like rockets. Their fiery tails act like engines and their manes like rudders. People often mistake them for shooting stars and wish upon them but their wishes are rarely granted, except on very moonlit nights. A herd of Ninetales can serve as a powerful weapon capable of burning out a small island nation in the Pacific Ocean. And they've done it a few times, but newspapers stay quiet about it since reporting on those kind of stories make Ninetales angry. People say a few Ninetales managed to fly to the moon, but they all died there due to lack of oxygen necessary for fire. When they're not being used in wars, they like to set off fireworks on holidays. Number 39, Jigglypuff. Jigglypuff are adorable and love singing more than anything in the world. Once in the company of other Pokemon, Jigglypuff grabs something that looks like a microphone and breaks into song with a gentle voice. However, Jigglypuff's voices are so gentle that other Pokemon quickly drift off to sleep. 
Jigglypuff gets very offended by this, so for revenge, they draw on the sleeping Pokemon's faces with markers. The Jigglypuff Opera House has a very unique layout. Instead of seats like a normal opera, it's filled with beds so the audience can drift off in comfort. Jigglypuff are also used medically for hypnotic sessions. They're amorous, shy, and often blush with embarrassment. Jigglypuff loves it when fans give them flowers. They smell them, then they eat them. Number 40, Wigglytuff. When Jigglypuff reach a certain age, they turn into Wigglytuff, who are soft, good-natured Pokemon, but with subtle signs of insanity. When Wigglytuff are in danger, they'll inflate like balloons, sometimes as big as a blimp. No one's scared of them, though, and some people use inflated Wigglytuff as toys in the pool or ocean. Kids love to roll around on them, climb on top, and jump off into the water. Wigglytuff pretends like it makes them mad and puffs up even more, but actually, they secretly enjoy it. They love collecting stickers and sticking them onto their naked bodies. A Wigglytuff covered with stickers is a comical but spectacular sight. Some prefer painting themselves with advertisements, though. Number 41, Zubat. Zubats do not have any eyes, only teeth. They don't need eyes because they live in caves and find their way around with echolocation, like bats do. Zubats like to feed on Taurus and cave researchers. When they see an opportunity, they dive with lightning speed at unsuspecting cavers and bite their necks. Their sharp teeth are venomous, but not fatal. They're more like tranquilizers. Zubats swoop down and suck the blood from sleeping researchers and Taurus, then fly away satisfied. It's unpleasant for their victims, sure, but not life-threatening. What's even worse is a chorus of Zubats singing in a dark cave. Their voices sound like vacuum cleaners, and echoes carry the sound deep into every nook and cranny. They only sing the classics, like A March from the Opera, Aida, Ride of the Valkyries, and Ode to Joy by Beethoven. Number 42, Golbat. No one knows how these strange Pokemon fly. They're the same size as Zubat, but heavy as pigs. They flop about, drink blood, swell up, and wander around caves dragging their wings. Basically, they're just deplorables and nobody cares about them, not even cops or journalists. They like telling stories about their younger days, like when there were army Zubats who could drink three buckets of blood. They're probably lying, but no one cares enough to look into it. Actually, Golbat are pretty pitiful when they're stumbling around their caves, no good to anyone living way past their prime and mumbling their favorite song. Golbat Dad, Dad Golbat, you didn't hide your wings behind boys' backs. Although, what boys' backs? There's no boys in the cave, only tourists. You didn't hide your heart behind boys' backs. Uh, okay, this definitely needs a bit more explaining. Golbat singing is a reference to an old Russian military song. This is the kind of thing where if it was a video game, localizers would just swap out the joke with something completely different, but we're trying to stay as true to the source material as possible here. There's certainly some wordplay here, but it's too hard to explain and doesn't really make any sense in English. It's just too confusing. On to the next one. Number 43, Oddish. Oddish are optimists with dark senses of humor and distant relatives of the Italian Cipollino. That's an Italian fairy tale, by the way. The leaves on their heads are poisonous, although some Oddish with edible leaves were recently discovered. They make for delicious salads. These strange Pokemon don't have arms, so you have to spoon feed or give them pacifiers. In Japan, they have Oddish feeding stations with plastic pacifiers stuck on the walls. Oddish like to drink fermented milk, coffee, and Japanese sake, then sing songs as they march off on a violent raid. Oddish know lots of jokes about Pokemon. They can live anywhere, even in garbage cans. If you hear laughter coming from a garbage can, there might just be an Oddish in there telling jokes. Number 44, Gloom. In the Pokédex artwork, Gloom's shaking hands with Kalabuk, a ball-shaped character from Russian folklore who's made of dough. He's probably just here because they kinda look similar. Anyways, Gloom's dex entry says, If you water the leaves on an Oddish's head with potassium, eventually spicy mushrooms grow sprout and it'll turn into Gloom. Gloom like to mock and antagonize people, so they tend to get slapped a lot. Then they stumble down the street, crying about their fate, even though they've got no one to blame but themselves. Most Gloom like writing poetry, which is why they have such tiny hands. But their poems are terrible. They're written in Japanese though, so hardly anyone understands them since Gloom live in the United States. That's because all Oddish grow up dreaming of moving to America. Americans make Tabasco sauce out of Gloom's spicy mushrooms, but the mushrooms themselves should never be eaten. Number 45, Vileplume. Vileplume live in poor neighborhoods. They hardly move and just bask in the sunlight squeaking. They try to garner sympathy from people walking past telling stories about how they become edible mushrooms, after being poisonous and inedible in their younger days. People in those neighborhoods all got used to having Vileplume around and use them as chairs in cafes and restaurants and sometimes get into conversations with them. Vileplume speak English with such terrible accents that everyone laughs at them and gives them sips of their Coca-Cola. 
Vile Plume's mushrooms are edible, though, but everyone's afraid to eat them because Otis and Gloom have such bad reputations. That's what happens when you take too long to get your act together. Vile Plume stops sharing their old poems from when they were young and don't write any new ones either. Number 46, Paris. Paris are relatives of mushrooms and everyone loves them, even though they have steel claws sharp enough to cut through a human leg. Instead of ears, they have poisonous mushrooms that can inflict paralysis. So it's a mystery why people love them so much. Maybe for their big, beautiful eyes. They look so kind. Paris sidle up to people and Pokemon they like, look up trustingly from below. Since they're only as tall as a stool, then shoot out spores. Then they bite the limbs of the lifeless body. In their free time, they like to talk about non-resistance to evil and secrets of the psyche. Paris are quite clueless. Number 47, Parasect. Parasect like to hide in cellars, although there are some cellars they can't fit in because they're huge and as heavy as hippos. They use their claws to catch mice, rats, and cats, and then eat them. The giant mushroom serves as both a Parasect's head and its hat, which is pretty convenient. Parasect are all blind. Many crimes weigh on a Parasect's conscience. When approached by young Paris, it'll tell them about the worst crimes it ever committed, like how it turned into a Parasect, for example. To evolve, it had to eat all the employees in a Miami insurance company after putting them to sleep with poison. 75 human lives. They just wanted to help Parasect by selling it life insurance, but ironically, it turned out that they were the ones who got killed. Number 48, Venonat. Venonat lives in hollow trees. That's where they're born, live their entire lives, and eventually die. They never leave their tree unless they turn into a Venomoth one day. They like listening to the radio, especially the latest news. When the news is over, Venonat poke their heads out of their tree and start yelling at the whole forest. They're always yelling about the same thing, that the end of the world is coming. They end their yelling with, don't forget what I told you, then go back to hiding in their trees. Venonats are poisonous, but nobody knows why. Their voices are nasty and their eyes are bloodshot from constant screaming. But if you approach one in the evening, light a fire under its tree, and speak to it calmly, it'll act like a completely different Venonat and open up to you, revealing its sad and lonely side. Number 49. Venomoth. If you've laid eyes on this giant butterfly and survived, count yourself lucky. Venomoth weigh 300 kilograms and can bite the head off a dog or even a horse. Only a few Venonat manage to eat enough honey to turn into Venomoth. They can't fly very well, three or four wing flaps, and then they flop to the ground. Some people tame Venomoth, then put them on trucks to show them off to their neighbors. An adult Venomoth sells for $500 on the open market. They work as nannies taking care of babies, the sick, and the elderly. Venomoth have no interest in politics. Tame Venomoth feel contempt for their wild relatives, who resent that contempt. And at least once a month, a wild Venomoth murders a tame one. Number 50, Diglett. Small diglet grow in ditches and roadsides. They don't have mouths, but they can absorb nutrients from soil. And they like to hide underground and dig passages. If you're careless and accidentally step on a diglet, it'll explode! If that happens, diglet's roots remain in the ground and eventually diglet grows back. Good as new. An exploding diglet can obliterate small Pokemon like Pidgey or Clefairy or even a human leg. People with domesticated Diglett plant them in windowsill pots and water them with Sprite, or sometimes Fanta. Sometimes their owners use them as fireworks or to blow up cars with loud car alarms that won't stop wailing. If you hear a car alarm going off in the middle of the night, a Diglett will probably come along soon enough to blow it up. Number 51, Doug Trio. Three Diglett can combine to become one Doug Trio. They may be small, but they have a terrible explosive power. On a few occasions, Doug Trio blew up entire trains. This makes them useful for military purposes, similar to landmines. But their nature is really quite peaceful, and more than anything, they like discussing movies and gossiping about actors and pop stars. Doug Trio chats ceaselessly, all speaking at the same time, but able to understand each other perfectly. Once they've had their fill of gossip, they'll find a bank burrow underneath and blow it up. They're often employed by robbers who say they'll pay Doug Trio once they've regrown from the roots, but it's a trick. By the time they've grown back, the robbers already ran off. Dugtrio don't like their work, but they don't have much choice in the matter since they don't know how to do anything else. They're quite cute and very friendly. Number 52, Meowth. Meowth are very enterprising cats and friends with Team Rocket. They're terrible scoundrels, frankly speaking. Their main weapons aren't claws or teeth. It's espionage, betrayal, slander, and deceit. Meowth know how to earn the trust of government officials and ministers, then tell them false stories, make them afraid of peaceful Pokemon, and play treacherous games, which results in unethical laws getting written. Meowth can even fool presidents, but not for long, of course. Eventually, Meowth get exposed and deported to another country. Then they start the horrible cycle all over again. 
It actually starts to get annoying after a while. Seven Meowth hoard almost the entire Pokemon money supply, a total of about $3 million. That's why other Pokemon hate Meowth and try to assassinate them, although they rarely succeed. Okay, um, we need to cut in here with some bad news. This Pokédex only featured original artwork for the first 52 Pokémon and a few others, but the rest just used their official artwork made by Game Freak. So far, I've been referring to this Pokédex as a book, but it was actually spread across five editions, with each one covering about 30 Pokémon. It seems the lawsuit we mentioned earlier is why the Russian artwork wasn't printed in later editions. We wanted to reach out to the book's author and illustrator to confirm that fact and find out if the rest of the Pokémon had Russian artwork made that just never got published. We'd really love to see them all, unfortunately contacting them proved impossible for reasons we don't want to get into now. So we'll talk about it at the very end. We managed to collect a few missing pieces from the illustrator's website. For now though, let's just say that if there were ever a full set of 151 illustrations, a good chunk of it appears to have been lost to time. Okay, let's continue. Number 53, Persian. Millionaire Meowth turn into Persian who ride in armored cars with primate bodyguards and get interviewed by newspapers. But they're terribly unhappy, always calculating something in their minds and convinced they've been robbed somehow. They lash out at everyone around them and scratch them with their claws. They apologize later, but by then it's too late. Their victims press charges and Persian get dragged into court where they spend a fortune on lawyers and bribing judges, but still have a hard time avoiding prison. Alas, this is no way to live. A wise Psyduck once said, to be a Persian is to never know happiness. Occasionally, Persian pay for the construction of a new McDonald's and everyone's happy for a few days. They all get burgers and Happy Meals that come with little plastic Persian toys. Number 54, Psyduck. Psyduck are clumsy fat platypuses who everyone thinks are dumbasses and mockingly refer to them as psycho ducks. They radiate psychic energy when they get hit on the head. They rarely get angry, but when they do, they can paralyze people. Psyduck are actually the wisest of all Pokemon, but they're careful to conceal their wisdom. They lock themselves in attics and write thick books only to bury them deep in the sands of a beach. They like to think maybe someday some kids will dig in the sand, discover their books, and read them. Psyduck spend their entire lives in poverty. They can only afford to survive because their friends give them food, and sometimes they wash cars to earn a little pocket money. Trainers don't think they have any use as fighters. Number 55, Golduck. Psyduck who get tired of being poor and hungry eventually sell out and lend their writing talents to corporations like Galena Blanca or Blenda Med to get rich. Then they turn into Golduck, which means Golden Duck. They spend their newly earned cash on refrigerators and TVs, make friends with people who work in newspapers and television, and then try to break their bad habit of waddling when they walk. They yell loudly in English, I can afford to buy whatever I want. They've given up writing books. Now they only write articles and advertisements. They're always muttering under their breath, swearing quietly and shaking their heads in disapproval. They try to be like Wartortle, but don't have what it takes. Wartortle can fight, but Golduck can only beat around the bush. Number 56, Mankey. Mankey are personal bodyguards, usually for movie stars, pop idols, and middle-class businessmen. But they're lazy and don't know how to do anything besides wave their fists around. Police departments never employ them. Mankey run a bit of a side hustle exchanging gum for cigarettes, cigarettes for Coca-Cola, then Coca-Cola for beer. They don't trade the beer though, they just drink it themselves in large quantities. When they're drunk, they start talking crap about their trainers. That's when Mankey's petty nature is on full display, so it's best to just tune them out. They love reminiscing about that time they killed a bunch of terrorists in the mountains of Nepal. The story was actually written by a poor Psyduck in exchange for a bottle of coke, but nowadays Mankey act like it really happened. They're so unsympathetic and don't feel sorry for anyone. Number 57, Primeape. As soon as Mankey starts working for Persian, it turns into Primeape. They wear iron bracelets on all four paws to look cool, even though it makes them 20 kilograms heavier. One time, a gang of Alakazam robbed a rich Persian by installing a huge electromagnet outside its cottage. When Persian walked out flanked by six Primeape, the gang switched on the magnet and all the bodyguards got stuck to it by their bracelets. The Alakazam tied up Persian with ropes as it meowed pathetically. The Primeape were helpless to watch while the cottage was ransacked for all its valuables. After that, all the Primeape got fired and replaced with Machamp. Number 58, Growlithe. 
People say these little Pokemon are prodigies. Growlithe can read, count, and draw beautifully. And they can even understand computer language. But they're very pampered and kind of lazy. They usually guard kindergartens and schools, and the children love playing with them. Despite their small size, Growlithe can fight off any predator with their teeth, spitting fire from their mouths. They like to eat condensed milk and chocolate. A lot of Growlithe grow up to become programmers, but their habit of spitting fire interferes with their work. And they burn up a lot of computers. Some train in martial arts to become Arcanine. They're very skilled and determined fighters. Number 59. Arcanine. Almost every Arcanine is a police lieutenant. They're very reliable and can solve many of the crimes perpetrated by Wartortle, Blastoise, Alakazam, and other dangerous Pokemon. Arcanine bite criminals, tear them to shreds, incinerate them with fire from their mouths, and relentlessly pursue them for many kilometers. When there's a soccer game coming up, the cops send a bunch of Arcanine to the stadium on buses to hold back the most violent fans. The cops thank them with sausages, and when they're especially brave, they're awarded medals of courage. After they retire, Arcanine write books about police work, cop dramas for TV, and teach other Pokemon martial arts. They're honest, loyal, and remarkably intelligent. Number 60. Poliwag. Poliwag live in the lakes of Scandinavia and northern Canada. They usually swim in shallow water, feed on tiny fish, and wait for their arms to sprout. Trainers catch Poliwag with fishing rods using Poliwag's favorite food as bait. Stimmerol sugar-free chewing gum. They keep the Poliwag they catch in barrels of rainwater. No one has any need for them yet because without hands, Poliwag are practically useless. Sometimes, though, barrels of Poliwag are sold off to fishing boat captains who use them to drive schools of herring into fishing nets. Poliwag surround the herring in a chain and start trumpeting. Their voices sound like car horns, which, for some reason, herring are afraid of. Number 61. Poliwhirl. As soon as a Poliwag grows arms, it jumps out of the barrel or lake it's in and becomes a Poliwhirl. They may be small, but they're dangerous fighters. Trainers usually train Poliwhirl to shoot submachine guns, then sell them in the Caribbean islands for a high price. Armed troops are always in demand there. A single squad of Poliwhirls capable of overthrowing the government of a small country like Haiti? Then they install a new president. Usually it's a huge clumsy water type monster known as Poliwrath. Then the Poliwrath president eats all the food reserves and hide the country's gold underwater. After that, the Poliwhirl organize political rallies, then a revolution, and finally, a carnival. They're very cheerful. Number 62. Poliwrath. Poliwrath live without a care in the world, just swimming in warm pools and eating sausages and bananas. They don't care about anything else. There are only a few dozen Poliwrath in the entire world. They like to arrange small parties for themselves, all fly to one location, and call it a summit. The source of their power is their immense wealth, which they stash underwater. Poliwrath collect weapons like pistols, machine guns, bombs, and cruise missiles. They sit in their underwater palaces, always hatching some new scheme. The US government is constantly at war with the Poliwrath and sends ships to hunt them down and bomb them. When a submarine approaches, Poliwrath fire torpedoes and are very happy when it impacts. Jesus Christ, man. Number 63, Abra. Abra are sly and deceptive and run Pokemon dating agencies. They always know what everyone's up to. They're friends with everyone, always kissing them and sharing gossip. Talk to an Abra and you can find out who Blastoise killed, how many eggs Fero laid, and where Ekans slithered off to. Thanks to Abra's agencies, every adult Pokemon can find a partner. Whether they're looking for friends, someone to battle, or someone to eat, Abra refuses no one. Abra likes doing aerobics, driving cars, and skydiving. They're very modern and love politics and kickboxing. One enterprising Abra organized an ice cream festival in Greece, another climbed a pyramid in Egypt, and one ate an entire plate of dried ants on a dare. They have no friends, only acquaintances, but they know pretty much everyone, almost the entire Pokemon community. Number 64, Kadabra. Abra became Kadabra by turning off their phones, throwing out their phone books, and cutting off communication with the outside world. Everyone asks each other, what happened to our sweet Abra? But by then, it's already Kadabra. They wear red stars on their foreheads, grow long mustaches, and hang portraits of Buddy Yanni on their walls. In case you didn't know, Buddy Yanni was a mustachioed cavalryman who fought in the Russian Civil War. Kadabra love to fight, but they're not allowed to, so their minds are always full of violent thoughts that ripple out like waves and leak into people's minds. It's best to just get up and leave if there are a lot of Kadabra around. Don't try to argue with them, or they'll tear you apart. Number 65, Alakazam. 
Alakazam are absolute bastards for three reasons. First off, they think themselves and a select few Kadavra are far superior to all other Pokemon, which gives them moral authority to control others. Second, they're convinced that anyone who disagrees with them should be shot. And the third reason is that they always want to eat, but never have any money, and no one gives them any. To be fair though, Alakazam have some good qualities too. Their brains are very powerful and computer-like. They can do huge calculations and predict the weather, so they're occasionally used in space centers. But most of them hate that job, so they blow up all the rockets and eat all the astronauts. After that, they're hunted down and locked in cages. Number 66, Machop. These agile little Pokemon are very talented. Machop can draw beautifully, compose music, and know mathematics and physics. They're also very good actors, but physically, they're pretty weak, which hurts their self-esteem. Still though, everyone thinks Machop have promising futures ahead of them. They like to eat fruit and watch cartoons. Machop live in attics where they paint and put on plays. Their worst enemies are Mankey, who are jealous of Machop and beat them up a lot. So lots of Machop take up bodybuilding to defend themselves, but some just skip town and move to little villages. Those villager Machop are beautiful creatures who make friends with beasts, birds, and pets. They love milking cows and riding dogs. Number 67, Machoke. Machop who get into bodybuilding turn into 100 kilogram Machoke. They have more muscles on their bodies than trees have leaves. An adult Machoke can easily bend a tire iron. But instead of bending it, Machoke usually use it to bludgeon the Mankey and Primeape who beat them up when they were kids. Machoke don't draw pictures, compose music, or put on plays. They don't have time for that anymore. They're too busy working out. They stand in front of a mirror for hours, flexing their muscles, striking poses, and smiling handsomely. They spend a lot of time training for bodybuilding championships. They usually win, and for first place, they're rewarded with boxes of chocolate and bags of apples. Then they give it all to Nidoran, who they're in love with. Machoke are happy creatures, and even though they're grown-ups now, they still love watching cartoons. Number 68, Machamp. You might be wondering why Machamp have four arms. Well, here's the story. One day, some African Mankey captured a Machoke, tied him up, and threw him down a well. Machoke was surely about to die, but by sheer strength of will, he managed to sprout two more arms and untie the knots, and thus he'd become a Machamp. He climbed out of the well, tracked down his abusers one by one, then threw them all in the same well and poured boiling olive oil down on them. This was the very first Machamp to ever exist. They're highly valued as laborers, and usually work in construction and mining where they can dig with two shovels at a time. There's a Machamp who's famous for playing piano with four hands, and another one who juggles. Number 69, Bellsprout. Bellsprout are poison bells who love kissing, but their kisses are poisonous, so if you get kissed by one, you'll die. They usually sprout up outside your house, then in the morning when you walk out, Bellsprout will say good morning and reach for a kiss. If you ever find yourself in that situation, just bonk it on the head with a briefcase so it stops tempting you with its dangerous pleasures. It might feel rude, but it has to be done. Otherwise, you'll be dead as a doornail. Bellsprout are used by doctors as anesthesia. If they kiss your ass instead of your lips, you'll just fall asleep for a few hours, then wake up perfectly fine. Bellsprout are affectionate, charming, and honest. Number 70, Weepin' Bell. Weepin' Bell never stop crying. They cry in the rain, they sob in the sunshine, they wail like beluga whales when sailors walk down the street. And if they get a C in math class, two buckets of tears. And all their tears are poisonous. People collect their tears in bottles and sell them to South American natives in the rainforest who soak their arrowheads and spears in the poison. Weepin' Bell work as loudspeakers at train stations, broadcasting arrivals, departures, and making announcements. But they never stop crying, and everyone who hears them cry too. Crowds of passengers stand on the platform sobbing as Weepin' Bell cries from above. <laughs> the train will depart in five minutes. Number 71, Victory Bell. Victory Bell usually hangs silently, and they're very arrogant. If you ask one for a favor or ask a question, it'll never answer. They appear to hate everyone, and they'll eat anything thrown into their big mouths. So they usually work as garbage disposals in restaurants, hotels, and stadiums. Candy wrappers, banana skins, empty cans, apple cores, and cigarette butts are thrown into their mouths and they digest every last morsel. Imagine that was your life. Now you understand why they hate everyone. 
Some Pokemon collectors, especially girls, give Victory Bell baths, wash their leaves, and let them eat cake. Then they turn into pleasant and intelligent companions, true friends, and connoisseurs of beauty. Number 72, Tentacool. Tentacool are big tadpoles, always searching for happiness. Crowds of them swim in warm ponds, and if you ask, what are you doing here? They'll all squeak in unison, we're searching for happiness. And they ain't joking. But finding happiness in a pond is no easy task. There's very little of it to go around, not enough for every tentacool. So, tentacool have no choice but to go ashore and look for happiness on land. But their legs are too frail. It's painful to watch a bunch of struggling, staggering tentacles stumble down a dusty road trying to push each other forward on the search for happiness. Tragically, they don't even know what happiness looks like. But they deserve respect for their determination, and Pokemon help them out with money and food as best they can. Number 73. Tentacruel. If a tentacruel ever finds happiness, it'll spout a dozen more legs and two strong claws for snatching prey. Now, it's a tentacruel. They don't believe in anything, not in friendship, and not in love. They're angry at the whole world. Most of them even hate the tentacle from which they came. Tentacruel grab them with their tentacles, tear them in half, and gobble them up. Sometimes, journalists search out Tentacruel and interview them about how they manage to find happiness. Everyone really wants to know, but Tentacruel eat them too. They're terrible villains. Tentacruel have an anthem they sing every morning and every midnight. I, Tentacruel, proud and brave, will take many Pokemon to their grave. That's a bit of an exaggeration, though. They'll kill any Pokemon, but not many. Number 74, Geodude. It's easy to mistake Geodude for small boulders. They lie peacefully in fields and forests, hiding their stone hands under their bodies, but if you accidentally sit on one, you'll immediately feel the impact of a stone fist punching your gut. Ew. <laughs> if that happens, run. They're slow runners, so they can't catch you. So long as you don't touch them, Geodude are quite friendly. They've got a lot to talk about because they've lived a thousand years and seen so much in their lifetimes. They like to lie at forks in the road with tattoos on their foreheads saying, Death to the right, swamps to the left, and who knows what's straight ahead. The choice is yours. One time, someone carved Geodude into a sculpture of the Roman god Apollo and erected it up in a park. But the next morning, it ran away. You might see it someday, walking around, looking like Apollo. Number 75, Graveler. A dozen Geodude can merge to make one Graveler, but only at very high temperatures. So the Geodude have to build a huge bonfire. It takes a long time for Graveler to cool down, then they go out to wander the earth. They're pretty typical wanderers, always stomping around and muttering prayers under their breath. Sometimes they fight in wars and form impenetrable walls with their stone fists. No one's ever successfully stormed a Graveler fortress. Graveler also know a lot of stories. In Denmark, they organize fairy tale festivals and five or six sit in a big meadow and tell stories to crowds of children. There are rumors that Hans Christian Andersen stole all of his fairy tales from Graveler. Number 76, Golem. Golem are living rocks, monuments to themselves, unbreakable, stubborn menaces. They usually lie in swamps and insist they used to be better, but they refuse to elaborate. Under no circumstances should you ever tease one. They are powerful enough to flatten armored vehicles full of soldiers. They shriek in anger, grind their stone teeth, and brandish their war medals. Some especially famous golem hang themselves like marble plaques with their accomplishments written in gold. They make for good tourist attractions. Interestingly, golem are all hollow. If you hit one with a log, it'll sound like an empty barrel. But don't do that though. It's dangerous. Number 77, Ponyta. Ponyta are little horses who are very romantic and constantly burning with love. If you see a Ponyta with a burning mane, tail, and torches on all four legs, that means it's in love with Pikachu. Ponyta always fall in love with Pikachu and give them rides on their backs. Sometimes Pikachu get burned and end up in the hospital. Ponyta work as secretaries, but they always screw everything up and lose money and paperwork. They're kept on staff though for their internal flame, sparkling eyes, and because they're the ones who pop open champagne bottles at office parties. Ponyta are always ready for self-sacrifice. One time, a young Ponyta was so hot in love, it burned down a huge warehouse full of stationery worth $5 million. Pikachu didn't even notice. Number 78, Rapidash. Male Ponyta turn into Rapidash when they grow up. The ground burns under their hooves. They're always running somewhere with bulging eyes and blazing fire. People ask, where are you running? Please tell me. But they never answer. There's no end to the trouble they cause firefighters. So they're usually kept in swimming pools to make their flames go out. Rapidash swim and curse through their teeth because all they want to do is burn and gallop. 
Suffice it to say, they cause a lot of damage and don't have much benefit to society. But for some reason, everyone loves Rapidash and think of them as heroes and flaming freedom fighters. It'd probably be better if they stuck to warming up northern cities during cold winters, but Rapidash get bored of that. So they run in a fiery herd, neighing about freedom and happiness, and all the other Pokemon admire them and cheer, yelling, Never change, Rapidash! Number 79, Slowpoke. Slowpoke are so slow and dumb that they're impossible to talk to. You'll say, good morning, Slowpoke, then hours later in the evening, they'll nod and say, good morning. And it'll take three days for them to laugh at a joke. Then when they finally do, they laugh for a really, really long time. Slowpoke make excellent production managers and many have climbed up the ranks of the army all the way to Colonel. A few have even been promoted to General, but they understand nothing and just blink their eyes. Slowpoke are kind fathers and devote a lot of energy to raising children. They're generally positive so long as you're patient with them. You should never hit one on the head. They don't like that. And an hour later, they might cry. And a Slowpoke Colonel bawling his eyes out is a pitiful sight. Number 80, Slowbro. Slowbro have strange bodies with metal tails covered in spikes. Even Golem are afraid of their tails. Slowbro work in several countries' intelligence services, catching spies, decrypting codes, and monitoring phone calls. They do it very slowly, but speed doesn't matter, only results. They speak many languages, but all very slowly and with weird accents. At first, it's kind of annoying, but eventually people get used to it. Slowbro love hunting, fishing, and bathing in saunas. When they retire, they move to countryside cottages and take up flower gardening, and some of them write books on how to hunt spies. In short, these Pokemon are very useful, so don't kill them. Number 81, Magnemite. Magnemite look like car parts or transformers. They have magnets in place of hands and three screws instead of a head. They do occasionally have thoughts though, and they're attracted to metal, sparkles, and buzzes. Magnemite are useful for finding metal objects like needles, paper clips, forks, and knives, but they're mostly used as minesweepers in the military. They detect mines hidden in the ground and rush at them. The mines explode, but Magnemite are made of iron, so they're not easily killed. They're mutilated and deformed beyond recognition, sure, but the mines don't kill them. Wounded Magnemite are awarded medals and share stories of their military exploits at elementary schools. Number 82, Magneton. Three Magnemite connect together to make one Magneton. These Pokemon have magnetic forces so powerful they can raise sunken submarines from the bottom of the ocean. Magneton can also transmit radio signals, so they're frequently launched into space as spy satellites who orbit the Earth and send intel to the military. American Magneton sometimes get into disputes with Russian Magneton, but they never fight. They just buzz at each other and eventually calm down. Sometimes two Magnemites' orbits cross in space and their magnets make them stick together. Then they just swap electricity back and forth. When that happens, it can cause magnetic storms and other phenomena on the Earth's surface. Eventually, Magneton fall out of orbit and crash into the Pacific Ocean. Number 83, Farfetch'd. Farfetch'd are terribly abrasive. They think everyone's always laughing at them and never show them any respect. So if a Farfetch'd runs into someone, it'll immediately melt down in hysterics, hurling insults and trying to slap them, so even trying to make friends with one is dreadful. Where'd you go to school? It'll ask suspiciously. And before you can even answer, it'll yell, You're an ass! And sometimes it's right. But other Pokemon don't take it personally. Farfetch'd are fat and short of breath, and it's hard for them to fly. So they work as newspaper journalists writing articles and making up lies. Their diets consist of frogs and oysters. Farfetch'd are all convinced they're smarter than everyone else. They like snapping photos of wild and powerful Pokemon like Blastoise and selling them for a dollar. Number 84, Doduo. Scientists have long debated what a Doduo is. Is it a family or just a single Pokemon? Well, it was recently proven it's actually a family consisting of two heads, one torso, and a pair of legs. They can run incredibly fast when searching for food. Doduo are considered flying Pokemon even though they can't fly. They simply don't have any wings, but their passports categorize them as flying. The truth is, they bribed the Ponyta that issued their passports and that's how they got the flying designation. Ponyta didn't have any qualms about taking the bribe, but that still wasn't good enough for Doduo. So they run around the world bragging about how they flew in the mountains above the clouds, high in the sky. 
When someone asks to see their wings, Doduo get offended and run away to another country. Then they do the same thing all over again somewhere else. In the agriculture industry, these inseparable Pokemon are used to pluck weeds. Number 85, Dodrio. Sometimes a third head sprouts in the Doduo family and they become a Dodrio. They can run incredibly fast and win every race they enter, but it's difficult for Dodrio to feed themselves since they have three mouths but only two legs. When they find a worm, they argue for a long time who should get it, but it's actually pretty pointless since they all share the same stomach and the worm ends up there regardless. Perhaps it's a matter of who gets to taste it? Dodrio make excellent mailmen, messengers, and advertising peddlers. They have thick, calloused feet that are so strong, sometimes they kill tigers with them. When Dodrio get tired, they sit on a stump and sing the baby head to sleep. It's a beautiful sight. The baby head falls asleep, bowing to the mother head, and the father head guards it while it sleeps. Number 86, Seal. Seal are fat and live on polar ice flows and eat fish. They're friendly, curious, and handsome. It's difficult for them to move on land, but they're skilled in water thanks to their flippers and tails. They can jump out of the water three meters high like a dolphin. Some seal move to the city and learn how to read and talk, then usually find jobs in the radio business because of their rich, velvety voices. Covered with ice, they sit in front of a microphone and work as disc jockeys on Radio Maximum and Europa Plus. These seal have lots of fans and make tons of money. They drive silver Mercedes with air conditioning, and some become movie stars. Seal usually have large families with lots of children. Number 87, Dugong. Dugong eat nothing but ice cream. Barrels of it, in fact. Because they're so big, white, and cool, they mostly lie on icebergs in Greenland where ice cream is brought to them on tanker ships. Then the citizens of Greenland shovel ice cream into barrels for Dugong. Feeding them gets expensive, but ice cream companies are willing to foot the bill because Dugong give them the rights to use the footage in ice cream commercials. They don't just eat in the ice cream commercials though, they also sing songs about ice cream with their thick baritone voices. They're harmless, really. Wouldn't hurt a fly. Not that there are any flies in Greenland anyway, just ice and polar bears that lick Dugong's leftover barrels. Number 88, Grimer. Grimer live in ditches, swamps, septic tanks, and anywhere else sewage gets dumped. They feed on the filth, which makes them smell terrible and have a pessimistic view on life. But despite all of that, Grimer are actually very smart and even wise Pokemon. They don't pretend to be anything they're not, don't have any hopes or dreams, and they don't expect anything good out of life. They look like floor rags made out of old bathrobes. All that said, no one knows how to find joy in the little things the way Grimer can. Sometimes they throw parties in seaports where the water's full of oil links, garbage, and various other kinds of pollution. Grimer splash around, giggling in a layer of rainbow-colored oil on the water's surface. There's floating garbage, dead rats, fish heads, and crumpled soda bottles. Grimer loves all of it, and onlookers are amused as they happily splash around in the filth. Number 89, Muck. Muck look like giant stinky jellyfish with huge mouths that suck in slime and sludge like garbage chutes. They live under the piers in resort towns, and sometimes they crawl out and scare tourists. Muck's slime trails are poisonous, so people have to wash it off the ground with bleach. More than anything, they like to drink crude oil. If more than five muck gather in one spot, the government declares an ecological state of emergency, bring in helicopters, and pour tons of dishwashing soap down onto the muck. They can predict the weather with 100% accuracy, foreign exchange rate fluctuations, and even election results. Anytime you see one of these dirty freaks, there's always a crowd of journalists right there next to it. They listen to Muck's predictions and record them on tape, then plagiarize and pass it off as their own work. Number 90, Shelder. Shelder are notorious clowns. They do Pikachu impressions, aren't afraid to laugh at Golem, and even make fun of the Rolling Stones. They're quite small, and when they float in the water, they look like naval mines. If you accidentally hurt a Shelder, it'll jump out of the water two meters high, stick out its tongue, and start laughing nastily and calling you dirty names. Shelder love rock music, and thousands gather at concerts screaming, sticking their tongues out, and swearing a lot. But they can also be very sentimental. When Shelder hear a sad song, they fall silent, hide their tongues, and light matches. Those are tears of tenderness in their eyes. They really like eating Snickers. And there are a lot of drug addicts and vandals who spray graffiti in the Shelder community. Number 91, Cloister. Shelder who can't break their drug addictions turn into Cloister. 
Their bodies are full of holes and covered in spikes, and they look like bizarre meteorites. They fly around with no idea where they're going and never know joy. Cloyster live at the bottom of the ocean, occasionally coming to the surface to search for food and heroin. The police round them up and force them to get jobs or educations. One cloister learned how to open bottles so skillfully with its spikes it got hired as a bartender. More often, they become road workers, parking lot attendants, or construction workers. But usually, they just sink back to the bottom of the ocean. Cloister are actually pretty smart and fun to talk to. Despite their hardships, they're quite optimistic and believe in their own inner beauty. Number 92. Ghastly. These rare Pokemon are ghosts that roam Europe, Asia, Africa, and America. Ghastly never go to Antarctica, though, because it's too cold. Ghastly look like purple clouds with evil-eyed black balls in the center. Sometimes they bite, which is pretty weird for ghosts. They live in ancient castles, dungeons, and fortresses. At night, Ghastly go out to frighten pedestrians and extort money and jewelry from them. The only thing they're afraid of are vacuum cleaners, because the newer models can suck them up. But it's futile to try to shoot them with guns or beat them with clubs. If you tame a Ghastly, you can go for walks together in the evenings and visit your friends. Number 93. Haunter. Ghastly turn into Haunter when there's a full moon on a warm August night. The purple cloud shrinks and turns into a round head with paws and ears, which is somehow able to fly. Haunter are soft like cotton, only their teeth are sharp. They hate large crowds of people. Soccer fans, protesters, disco heads, etc. Haunter drop down on them from above and bite. Their victims fall asleep, but unlike Zubat, Haunter don't drink their blood. Instead, they pull out their souls. But only if they have one, of course. Haunter eats people's souls, and don't even shy away from little souls. Vile, pitiful souls are Haunter's main form of sustenance. Because there are few noble and honorable souls in this world. Well, at least not at discos, soccer games, and protests. Number 94, Gengar. When a Haunter gets a belly full of human souls, it'll turn into Gengar. They're very energetic, sentimental, and airheaded. They dance in the clouds, singing songs about different races of people. Gengar's favorite are the Neapolitans. That's people from Naples, Italy, by the way. Gengar trainers love flying on them by tying a basket underneath and using them like hot air balloons. Gengar are hard to control, so it's dangerous, but incredibly thrilling. They're very greedy when it comes to young women. If they see one while they're out flying around, Gengar will drop like a stone to suck out their soul. The trainer in the basket usually gets killed when that happens. In Sweden, people hold annual Gengar races, but make sure to hide every young woman in restaurants and cafes first. There's no shortage of them in Sweden. But the girls get curious and lean out their windows to take a peek, and that's when Gengar gets their chance to pick off a few victims. Number 95. The one, the only, Onyx. Onyx are huge rockworms who can block traffic by stretching themselves across roads. They're very dangerous in battle, attacking with lightning speed and strangling their foes with stone nooses. For food, they eat raw cement. Onyx's brains are made of concrete, so they make horrible creaking noises when they're thinking. But it's pretty rare a thought ever enters their stupid brains. Onyx reproduce by division. They split into two halves, then a stone head, mouth, and eyes immediately appear on the tail end. It's especially scary when it happens in battle, because now you're fighting two Onyx instead of one. If left alone, Onyx will lie peacefully on a road for years on end, pretending to be rocks and creaking their brains, wondering where it can find a bucket of fresh cement. Number 96. Drowsy. The friendly fatso Drowsy will stare at you for a minute without blinking. Then you'll realize you're completely under its control. It'll make you hand over your wallet, your keys, house keys, and write a will that says Drowsy gets everything when you die. And you'll be perfectly happy to do so. Drowsy have lots of admirers who want to learn their methods. They live in huts on the beach and eat shellfish, and Drowsy drive around in their cars and eat black caviar at their expense. That's the power of Drowsy's gaze. So if you ever run into one, you need to kick it right in its fat belly and walk away with a proud air about you. Drowsy won't be offended, quite the contrary actually. They'll respect you for it. They make for good friends and loyal Pokemon. Number 97, Hypno. Drowsy change drastically after they turn into Hypno. They sleep for weeks in the mountains, lying in sleeping bags and catching humans' dreams. Every night, people produce millions of dreams and Hypno eats so many that they will gain a lot of weight. When a Hypno finally wakes up and descends from the mountains, you should avoid it. 
Otherwise, it'll torture you with nonsensical stories. Those are the dreams leaking out of its mouth. The most talented hypno become authors, but the ones who can't write just sit in bars and chat with people over coffee or beer. People are happy to pay for hypno's drinks because their stories are so fun to listen to. Number 98, Krabby. Krabby are just ordinary crabs that, for some unknown reason, wanted to become Pokemon. It seems that even crabs want to feel special. Krabby live in streams, small rivers, and channels. They eagerly read every scrap of newspaper that floats by, so they're very knowledgeable. Krabby use what they learned to become Pokemon, which made the rest of the crabs jealous. Krabby are philosophers and deep thinkers. They only crawl sideways because of their philosophy. They believe it's impossible to go forward, and there's no use going back. Going sideways reveals new perspectives on what they already have. Despite their philosophical depth, Krabby still get canned along with all the normal crabs. People don't care if they're deep thinkers. But even this harsh reality makes sense in Krabby's philosophy. Number 99, Kingler. Kingler are Krabby who lost faith in philosophy and crawled into the sea to make money. Their claws are so powerful they can cut through metal. Kingler find shipwrecks, negotiate with scrap metal companies, then cut up the ships and sell them piece by piece. It's a very profitable business for Kingler. It turns out there's no need for philosophy if you've got huge pincers. But actually, Kingler don't have much use for money. They don't eat much, don't play cards, and don't drink expensive wine. So they use their money to sponsor ballet competitions. The sad truth is that Kingler never learned to walk straight or throw their legs up high. They spent their whole lives crawling sideways, so now they want to help young ballet dancers do what they couldn't do themselves. Dance beautifully. Number 100, Voltorb. The electric ball Voltorb have such piercing screeches when they're attacked that it's best not to mess with them. It's not dangerous, just painful to listen to. It's much better to use Voltorbs as bowling balls. You just need to cover their ears with tape and make a deal for how much electricity you'll give them for each pin they knock over. Voltorb never miss. They'll knock down every pin and you will win. Then you need to hold up your end of the bargain and plug Voltorb into an outlet. Just to make sure not to give them too high a voltage. It could make them insane. Hordes of insane Voltorb roll down the streets and destroy everything in their path. They're a huge problem in Canada, France, and Great Britain because people in those countries always give Voltorb the wrong voltage. Number 101, Electrode. Electrode are huge pranksters. They have two metal coils growing on their foreheads with a combined power of 12,000 volts. Electrode likes to quietly roll up to a friend and touch them on the arm, stomach, or neck with one of their whiskers. The friend's life can be saved, but only sometimes. Electrode are incredibly stupid. They believe 12,000 volts gives them the right to talk about anything and everything. They like to argue in a very idiotic manner, but they're only useful for reviving young women who fainted. An electric shock through their coils instantly zaps the girl up to her feet, then she'll smile and even thank the Pokemon. That's all it takes. Then Electro will roll up and try to touch her with its whiskers, but that's when she really needs to run. Number 102, Execute. Execute are actually just swarms of small eggs who always stick together. There are several hundred of them in the swarm. Many have been dead for a long time, empty inside with broken heads, but still part of the team. Execute pile on top of their victims, sticking all over them until they lose the will to resist. Bears, tigers, and even heavyweight wrestlers will be left lying helplessly, eyes darting around, unable to move. The eggs crawl all over it, rolling, rustling, hissing. They can only be stopped by spraying them with a fire extinguisher to get them all stuck to each other. Fried Execute are still capable of thought, but they don't make for a good meal. They're very bitter. Sometimes people throw Execute at theater actors. Number 103, Executor. The biggest miracle in the Pokemon world is when a swarm of Execute turn into an Executor. Well, except maybe Machamp's second pair of arms. Suddenly, the Executes surround a lilac or buckthorn bush, stick to it, and legs grow out of the bush. After that, the bush goes on a walk, but it's not a bush anymore. It's an Executor. They're often used for street advertising, walking up and down the sidewalk, chanting slogans like, The new generation chooses Pepsi! Some political parties hire them during election season. These Pokemon have a lot of mouths, but no brains. All they have in their heads are leaves, so they just yell out whatever they're told. And they're convinced they're fighting for truth, even if they're not. Number 104, Cubone. 
Keybone chew their opponents down to their bones, then use those bones to scare away other enemies. They wear their skulls and mumble threats and curses. At home, they have entire warehouses of bones covered with dust and cobwebs. It's pretty creepy, actually. When you see a Cubone sitting in a broken old recliner watching television covered in bones, it doesn't inspire much sympathy. They work as night shift security guards, janitors, and warehouse managers, scaring off thieves by banging bones against their skulls. Cubone are very upstanding citizens who never steal anything themselves. They don't have any relatives or friends, except some kangaroo buddies who occasionally visit from Australia, who just come and hop around a while before they fly back home. Weird. Kangaroo one. It's not even a Pokemon. Number 105, Marowak. Marowak are nicknamed the Bone Collectors and live in abandoned cemeteries digging up graves and stealing the bones inside. They piece them together in a bizarre skeletons of people, animals, and Pokemon that never even existed. Like a skeleton with three heads, eight arms, or a leg on its shoulder. Oddly enough, some people actually like those bone monsters. They're often hired to plan expos, and they're often written about in newspapers, even though they're objectively hideous and insane. If you find yourself in a cemetery at night and hear sniffing sounds in the bushes, don't be frightened. It's just Marowak digging up graves. They're no threat to the living. They're only interested in the dead, or to be more precise, their bones. Just leave them about their business. No one cares about Marowak anyway. Number 106. Hitmonlee. Hitmonlee have springy legs with terrifying strength. One kick can knock the teeth right out of an opponent's mouth. They're very irritable, impressionable, and mentally unstable. Hitmonlee work in advertising agencies, drive taxis, and service slot machines. When they talk to clients, sometimes they'll lose their temper and start kicking wildly. As a result, they tend to spend more time in jail than they do working. A few Hitmonlee have gone on to build successful careers in breakdancing, hip-hop, and other popular forms of dancing, where they use their springy legs to move rhythmically and jump high as a ceiling. The secret to dealing with Hitmonlee is actually pretty simple. You just need to lubricate their springs with machine oil on a regular basis. Then, they'll be on their best behavior. Number 107, Hitmonchan. These extremely weak Pokemon of Chinese origin are natural-born boxers. They lift weights only as heavy as mosquitoes. Their fists fly by so fast, it looks like they have a hundred of them. Hitmonchan are insanely brave. They'll rush fist first even at Graveler, Golem, and Nidoking. They barely even notice the blows, but Hitmonchan keeps pummeling them till it eventually faints from exhaustion. Hitmonchan live in Chinatowns, form gangs of about 300, and brutally beat large cockroaches and mice. Hitmonchan fall over if you blow on them too hard, and a flick on the forehead knocks them out for two weeks. Body blows are fatal, but despite their frailty, they're bold, cocky fighters. The pride of Chinese fighting Pokemon. Number 108, Lickitung. Lickitung's defining features are their tongues, which can stretch up to two meters. In battle, they wield it like a club, and in day-to-day -day life, they use it for communication. It's not uncommon to see two Lickitung's licking and hugging each other with their tongues, and using them to give each other gifts. A lot of Lickitung work as window washers. They can wash windows with their tongues in an instant, and for payment, they only ask for peaches and oranges, then grab them with their tongues and toss them into their mouths. Lickitung's odd behavior gave birth to the expression, to run your tongue, and my tongue is my enemy. They get tangled up in their tongues a lot, and they occasionally get killed when their tongue gets wound around the wheel of a passing car. Wound around the wheel, wound around the wheel. Number 109, coughing. Coughing are dug up from abandoned mines where they lie around in darkness. They're filled with methane, a gas that's as poisonous as it is explosive. That's why terrorists use coughing as car bombs, shove them into garbage bins, or leave them on buses. Coughing just sit wherever they're put until they eventually explode. They have thin shells so they don't leave any remains or cause any casualties. It can be pretty terrifying though. If the methane's carefully let out of a coughing and replaced with hydrogen, It'll just float slowly and sadly. Coughing are rarely given jobs. They can be found at kindergartens where they accompany children on walks and a couple of coughing work as chemistry teachers. One even became a school principal. Number 110, Weezing. Weezing love car exhaust. They crawl up to a Mercedes from behind, shove the exhaust pipe in their mouths and inhale. 
They get high off the fumes and roll around the streets yelling, We've been betrayed, dudes! When that happens, a special wheezing mobile comes to pick them up and take them to a dump where they can eat garbage and come to their senses. Wheezing are all filthy, disgusting, and unshaven. But a few wheezing manage to climb their way to the highest rungs of society and become bankers and businessmen. They have a whole staff of servants who wash them, feed them vegetables, and spray them with deodorant. But a couple times a year, even rich wheezing can't resist the urge to find an old Zaporozhets and spend two weeks in its garage huffing exhaust. That's a popular Soviet-era car made in Ukraine, by the way. Number 111, Rhyhorn. Rhyhorn are simple-minded bandits who carry out their gang's orders without hesitation. If a Rhyhorn's ordered to dig a ditch, it'll keep digging until it eventually reaches the ocean. A combat squad of five or six Rhyhorn can rob a bank, kidnap an Asian prince, and shoot up an airport. Rhyhorn can't read, not even advertisements. But they love watching Mexican soap operas and cry heavy lead tears at the emotional parts. When the show's over, Rhyhorn turn off the TV and set out to kill. They're difficult to deal with. It's impossible to explain anything to Rhyhorn, so you can only give them commands. But they'll only take orders from their gang leader. Rhyhorn spend all their money on slot machines, dreaming of making millions, but they never win because they're idiots. Number 112, Rhydon. Compared to Rhyhorn, Rhydon are true intellectuals and proud they can walk upright. They live in subway tunnels, mines, and catacombs. For vacation, they go to active volcano craters in Kamchatka in Peru, where they spend a month swimming in molten lava. They're sort of like fireproof safes and heavy as one too. Nothing can dent a ride on, which is why the military use them to test experimental weapons. They shoot them with flamethrowers, drop nuclear bombs on ride on divisions, and blast them with rockets. Ride on barely feel a thing. They like it, actually. They draw straws for the chance to get shot with nukes and very happy if they win. Number 113, Chansey. Chansey are kind and caring, carry bars of soap in their pockets and work in Pokemon centers. A lot of Pokemon get their arms, legs, and tails torn off in battle, so Chansey tend to them after their surgeries. And of course, wash them with soap. Chanseys themselves never fight. Instead, they persuade their opponents with words and smiles. In addition to caring for Pokemon physically, Chansey are also good listeners and happy to listen to their patients talk about their loved ones. Chansey's favorite hobby is photography. They take pictures of people and Pokemon and post them on the internet. Every picture is taken with love. Even stupid Rhyhorn, dim-witted Pidgey, and hot-tempered Charizard like Chansey. They're like mothers to each and every Pokemon without exception. Number 114, Tangela. Tangela live in African jungles. They're covered with vines instead of hair, and they're always worried about where to get the cheapest haircuts or perms for their vines. Female Tangela dye their vines red, curl them, and style them into updos. African tribes hunt these Tangela and sell them to American tourists. Tangela have a lot of problems like giraffes eating from their heads and elephants feasting on their vines. Tangela are terrified of elephants, so they don't fight back. They've got no choice but to sacrifice their appearance in exchange for safety. Tangela go bald and their vines fall off when they get old. Then they're just naked balls with eyes and feet who hide from hunters and wild animals and burrows and use combs to brush the few vines they still have left. Number 115, Kangaskhan. Kangaskhan are marsupial Pokemon, similar to kangaroos, who raise their young in belly pouches. Most Kangaskhan are bosses, like CEOs or governors. Their babies inherit their management styles. They shout out everyone from inside their pouch, giving orders and behaving without shame. None of it bothers their mamas, though. Kangaskhan and their babies love celebrations in their honor, complete with shows, songs, flags, and banners. Mama will stand on a platform with the baby sticking out of her pouch, both wearing general's caps. They wave their arms to greet the crowd, and the crowds chant, Kangaskhan! Kangaskhan! It's a marvelous sight to behold. Number 116, Horsey. Horsey are seahorses who gain the affection of gullible water Pokemon by professing their love for them. Horsey revel in the drama and lying to all their lovers. They have countless relationships, one in every sea, while their husbands sit in the Amur River catching tadpoles. The moment you come across a horsey, she'll shoot ink from her nose and you'll be stuck in it up to your ears. So it's important you immediately snap off her horns and swim to shore. Horsey love money, spectacle, wine, and a beautiful life on coral islands. 
But more often than not, they live in musty bays overgrown with algae and make one of their lovers, a Bulbasaur or whatever, clean it up. Most Pokemon think Horsey are sophisticated and deep, but they're actually pretty shallow. Number 117, Seedra. When they grow old, beautiful Horsey turn into bitter old Seedra the menace of shallow straits and sandbars. They swim around all day searching for food and former lovers who sailed away to destinations unknown. Cedra teach young fish and crabs how to live. They also work for trainers and nannies for young Pokemon, ironing their shorts and washing their clothes. It's important for Cedra to distract herself with work. In the evenings, Cedra crawl ashore and watch the sun set over the ocean. They reminisce about all the lovers they had in their youth. Sharks, dolphins, tuna, and so on. They like to think that old life wasn't in vain. Then Cedra dive into the waves again and chase after passing ships, hoping to catch some potato peels and dinner crumbs thrown overboard. Number 118, Goldeen. Goldeen are goldfish that people call the Sea Queen. They're cute, flirtatious Pokemon with poisonous spikes on their head. If you get stung by one, you'll get muscle cramps. Like most species of water Pokemon, Goldeen love going to annual carnivals in the Red Sea. The rest of the time, Goldeen sell jewelry to rich tourists in Mediterranean resorts as a way to save money for the next carnival's lighting budget. They hunt for jewelry in sunken ships and occasionally find valuable treasures. Rich tourists have a hard time haggling with Goldeen because they have to dive underwater with their money. Often, there's simply not enough time. They have to come up for air and then dive back down to continue bargaining. Number 119, Seeking. Seeking are all bullies who prey on young female swimmers off the Spanish coast. Seeking sneak up and rip off their swimsuits with their sharp horns, then swim off as the girls are left totally naked. If you see a naked swimmer coming ashore, try not to laugh at her. She must have been the victim of a seeking attack. But a lot of swimmers actually like it. After having their swimsuits stolen, they get interviewed, become famous, and do nude photo shoots for magazine covers. Seeking gather near the island of Mallorca to show off their stolen swimsuits and have competitions for most successful hunt. Long story short, it's a win-win for Seeking and the swimmers. Number 120, Staryu. Staryu are large starfish with suction cups who lie at the bottom of the ocean and think. They think about who to give awards to and what for. Once a month, the Council of the Twelve Smartest Staryu gathers. They debate for a long time without words, conveying thoughts using only their suction cups, and then, having agreed on the awards, they crawl out of the sea and stick themselves to the winners. But they don't reward people or Pokemon because they couldn't bear Staryu's weight. So they stick themselves to famous planes, outstanding tanks, high-rise buildings, and TV towers. They've also awarded a bunch of museums and ancient castles, and one time they awarded a bathhouse. But that was an exceptional occurrence. Staryu hang on and are proud of themselves and the award winners. Unfortunately, they don't stick on for very long. Staryu's suction cups dry out and eventually fall off. Number 121, Starmie. Dried up Staryu becomes Starmie. They're not as big, but they're a better design, and people can wear them thanks to their smaller size. So Starmie award themselves to millionaires who wear them on holidays and display them under the back windows of their Mercedes. Policemen salute when they see a Starmie. Sometimes Starmie awards can be a problem though, like when they're hanging on the neck of an old general. Of course the general's pleased, but Starmie weigh half a pound. After standing for a while, he'll fall down and the Starmie flies off. It's an embarrassing situation for everyone involved. Therefore, generals don't like being awarded with a Starmie and rather just get some cash. Starmie have good senses of humor. Number 122, Mr. Mime. After graduating from Marcel Marceau's famous mime school in Paris, Mr. Mime perform in circuses all around the world. But there aren't enough circus jobs for all of them, so many have no choice but turning into pickpockets. A lot of them hang out on the streets of Hong Kong. Mr. Mime can pick your pockets so smoothly you won't even realize till a month later. The most skilled ones can even steal money sewn into people's shorts, undershirts, bras, and other underwear. No one knows how that's even possible. Some people think Mr. Mime do it by hypnotizing the victim. Curiously though, their tricks don't work on Pokemon. Mr. Mime get beat up a lot by Squirtle and Psyduck, who take their money and spin it at pubs. A little bonus trivia here, this Pokédex says Mr. Mime trained at Marcel Marceau's Mime School. Marceau was a famous real-life mime who took off the makeup to join the French resistance to fight Nazis in World War II. Then, after the war, he opened his own mime school. There are a couple Mr. Mimes nicknamed Marcel in red and blue and Sword and Shield as clear homages to the legendary French mime. Number 123, Scyther. 
Scyther are hybrids of dinosaurs and locusts. They're tall as human men, but even heavier and much more dangerous thanks to their razor sharp wings. The expression close shave comes from these Pokemon because when they're flying, they can cut tops off trees, telephone poles, and if they're angry enough, human heads. But Scyther aren't dangerous if you give them some gingerbread, waffles, and cookies to eat. Most work as hairdressers. In the city of Oslo, there's a barber shop where 15 Scyther give haircuts and shaves. The shop is thick with the sound of chirping and metallic wing flicking. Hair flies in all directions and from time to time an ear or two or the tip of someone's nose. Norwegians love getting their haircuts there because it adds some excitement into their otherwise boring lives. Number 124, Jinx. Jinx are very unusual Pokemon, seldom studied by science. They're descended from genies in bottles and always drunk on gin and tonic. Small in stature with long hair, Jinx wander around subway stations, reading people's palms and telling their fortunes with tarot cards. Jinx's fortune tellings are incredibly accurate, in a way, but what will happen is always the exact opposite of what Jinx predicts. Jinx's icy nature only manifests itself in the glacial calmness they have filling out paperwork and trying to obtain identity cards. The police frequently round up Jinx and deport them to the Middle East. Then they gather on the border between Israel and Egypt and have no idea where to go next. Number 125, Electabuzz. Electabuzz charge themselves at power plants, turbines, and transformers. Once they're fully charged, they find some high voltage power lines to work across. Electabuzz have jobs supplying electricity to isolated mountain villages, drilling rigs in Siberia, and Arctic outposts. Teams of them are parachuted wherever they're most needed. They shoot out sparks nonstop, which is a beautiful sight to behold in the sky when they're parachuting into the tundra. As soon as they land, the electric currents immediately start flowing. Boilers come to life and everyone's happy. When Electabuzz run out of electricity, they're put in clear plastic bags and sent to power plants to recharge. Number 126, Magmar. The entire surface of Magmar's bodies are on fire. Their tails, legs, and sometimes even their heads. It all depends on Magmar's mood. When they're angry, their hands flare up, and when they're embarrassed, it's their cheeks. Magmar live in fire pits. In Russian villages, people put Magmar in their ovens to use their fire and bake pancakes and pies, which Magmar love to eat. Unfortunately, it's difficult to get a real Magmar in Russia because they come from Africa and it's almost impossible to transport a burning Magmar such a long distance. There's only one way to do it transporting them by sea in water-filled containers, just like dolphins. Magmar's flames are extinguished underwater, so when they arrive in Russia, they have to get dried out for a long time, given moonshine to drink, taught Russian expressions, and then finally, they're ready to get stuffed in the oven. Number 127, Pincer. Professor O created Pincer in his laboratory using wire cutters that were fed screws and nuts for a long time. It's advised not to engage in battles with Pinsir. They can pierce train cars with their horns and break cast iron pans with their teeth. Around the house, Pinsir can be useful as top-notch can openers. They're also used as jaws of life to cut car crash victims out of their mangled vehicles. Despite their menacing appearance, Pinsir are really just good-natured goofs. So long as you don't touch them. They like aluminum tools and other non-ferrous metals. Aristocratic pincer like to eat gold jewelry they acquired by cutting into bank vaults. Number 128, Tauros. Tauros are basically just ordinary bulls, but bigger and with three tails. The whims of fate turn them into Pokemon, otherwise they would have been used in Spanish bullfights and quickly killed. The mystery of why they have three tails confounds scientists, but doesn't bother Tauros. Pokemon have a lot of fun with them. If you ever go to Mexico, you'll see Tauros running down the street pulling three kids on roller skates, each one holding onto one tail. Kids also like tying pans on Tauros' tails and making them run down cobblestone pavement, which makes an unbearable clanging sound. When cows meet Tauros, they lose their minds and fall head over hooves in love. Number 129, Magikarp. Magikarp are so cynical, it's actually disgusting. They know someday they'll turn into Gyarados, terrifying half-serpent, half-dragons practically unmatched in the sky and underwater. So Magikarp sail the seas and demand protection money from their future wrath. There's a word for that. Ah, extortion. Other Pokemon don't like being extorted, so they slip dead worms into Magikarp's lunch. But they're still afraid that after they become Gyarados, they'll get revenge on them. 
Magikarp gangs hang out in the Sea of Japan, demanding protection from Japanese fishermen and making fun of them. Usually they demand their favorite food, crab sticks. They swim underwater and laugh amongst themselves about their shakedowns and extortion. <laughs> the scumbags. Number 130, Gyarados. Gyarados are 10 meters long and terrifying and jump out of the water like rockets into the sky. They stretch themselves to maximum length and fly off eyes bulging. Usually their opponents die of horror just from laying eyes on them. Gyarados are proud of their coloring and spend a lot of time curling their mustaches and trimming their fins, which also serve as wings. But they can't do anything to you if you're not afraid. You just need to yell loudly and clearly, GET OUT OF HERE GYARADOS, and they'll fly away in shock. But most people don't know that, and entire herds die simply out of fear. They mostly live in New Zealand, and when they're not spreading terror, they like to dance in the sky. When a Gyarados reaches old age, one day, it'll suddenly burst like a balloon and its empty skin will slowly waft down to the ground. Number 131, Lapras. These giant Pokemon look like boats and work in transportation, carrying teams of Pokemon and trainers on their backs across the ocean. Along the way, Lapras tell tales of the sea and ask for advice about who they should marry. Lapras have a hard time finding mates due to their massive size. Other Pokemon love Lapras for their directness and sincerity. They're often asked to judge legal disputes, like outstanding debts, reasoning with clients, and dealing with fraudsters. Lapras listens to the details of the case, think for a couple minutes, then issue an impartial judgment. If Lapras decide you're right, they'll drown your debtor or partner in the sea. But if they decide you're wrong, it'll be you who gets drowned. Lapras will tie a Geodude around your neck and you'll sink to the bottom of the ocean. Lapras refuse to be paid for acting as judges. They only care that justice is served. Number 132, Ditto. Ditto look like huge pieces of chewing gum and can change into any shape. They sculpt their fellow Pokemon, artists, football players, and politicians from their own bodies. One moment they'll look like pillows and the next they'll look like small copies of Zhirinovsky. That's a right-wing politician who died in 2022, by the way. Sometimes people beat Ditto with sticks. It doesn't bother them, though. It feels nice, actually, and the sticks bounce right off. Ditto will even transform into various bastards who encourage people to beat them even harder. Ditto started a small business called Beat Your Enemies Heads In. They'll come to your house and transform into someone you hate. And you can beat them up with red-hot steam irons. For your pleasure, Ditto will scream, I give up! Oh no, I'm so sorry! It's a great way to blow off some steam for their customers. Number 133, Eevee. Eevee are little squirrels who have the unique ability to transform into one of three different Pokemon, depending on their personality and behavior. They get really annoyed that everyone's always talking what they'll evolve into, but they don't care and only live for their own pleasure. In the daytime, Eevee sit in burrows and listen to music with headphones, and the evenings, they go out and have fun. You can usually find them playing slot machines where they try to win money to spend on nightlife. Eevee beg for a single coin, then they get really lucky with it. By midnight, they'll have a big bag of money and spin it in nightclubs dancing till dawn. If they're low on cash, they'll just get some ice cream or go to a movie theater. That's what they do every day. Music, movies, gambling, and clubbing. All the other Pokemon are jealous of Eevee's fantastic luck. Number 134, Vaporeon. Eevee who drink too many cocktails turn into blue sea cats called Vaporeon. Vaporeon live off the coast of Crimea in the Black Sea. At night, they crawl out of the water and onto battleships in the Black Sea fleet. Late at night, there's usually only one officer on duty who's either sleeping or watching TV, and Vaporeon bribe them so they can stay on board. Vaporeon are born sailors and love standing on watch. The whole night, Vaporeon sail across the Black Sea, shining their searchlights and occasionally launching torpedoes. Torpedoes are expensive though, so the officer on duty charges Vaporeon $3,000 for the privilege. After having their fun on battleships all night, Vaporeon jump overboard to get some sleep in the ocean. Number 135, Jolteon. Eevee who play a lot of roulette turn into electric goats called Jolteon. They're always nervous and shoot off sparks with their hair standing on end. Unlike Eevee, Jolteon are very unlucky gamblers. 
They lose their entire savings than the savings of their family and friends. Entire herds of loser Jolteon live in Las Vegas, scraping together a living by charging batteries and licking cars. Jolteon who hit rock bottom work as lighters, lighting people's cigarettes or gas stoves for a penny. A lot of rich people in Florida keep Jolteon as house pets, where they run from guest to guest lighting their cigars and pipes. Sometimes they commit suicide by setting their master's house on fire and burn to death inside, along with all their master's possessions. And, and we're just gonna end it on that, huh? Number 136, Flareon. The few Eevee who manage to overcome their gambling addictions turn into flaming squirrels called Flareon. But even without all the gambling, the life of a Flareon is quite dangerous. They're so attractive and flammable that their whole lives are spent in chaos. Flareon meet an Abra or Horsey, fall in love, and light up like a torch. If they accidentally get too hot, Flareon and their lovers both catch on fire. Flareon's not bothered by the flames, but their lovers are burned alive and turn into piles of ash. Flareon cry and bury their beloved, and all their tears put out their flames. But as soon as the tears are dry, Flareon chase after a new lover. If they're smart, they'll spray Flareon with a fire extinguisher first before getting too close. Number 137, Porygon. Porygon are sold as a kit. If you build one from all the little pieces and say the magic word, it'll come to life and be your friend. The words written on the inside of the box, it's usually bonsai. Porygon are all naggers. They're always nagging you to wash the dishes, brush your teeth, and do your homework. They'll follow you around the house, stomping their wooden legs to make sure you do your chores. If it gets annoying, you can always take your Porygon apart and put it back in its box. Porygon's heads and bodies are transparent, and it's plain to see there's nothing inside. No heart, no liver, and no brains. But they're actually quite intelligent and capable of suffering, which proves they do have souls just like any other Pokemon. Number 138, Ammonite. Omnite are all jokesters who work as presidential advisors. They often appear on TV talking about the economy and snickering behind their mustaches. Omnite are nothing but heads. Sometimes they have bodies, arms, and legs attached through surgery, but those sort of operations are expensive, so they're usually only possible in richer countries. Omnite's skulls look like snail shells. Their eyes are expressive, but their main strength lies in their mustaches. They're detachable and come in different styles and colors, which can be used to gauge the state of a nation's economy and which direction the political winds are shifting. If an Omni puts on a black mustache, that means things aren't going too well. When they wear blue mustaches shaped like combs, that means the economy is improving. And a red curled mustache means the country's on the knife's edge of a political crisis. Number 139, Amistar. When Omni outlive their intelligence, they become Amistar. They're completely insane, constantly quoting Vladimir Lenin, Mahatma Gandhi, and Saddam Hussein. They slither down the road, leaving slime trails that drive janitors and cops crazy. They like to drop hints that they know government secrets, but won't tell anyone what they are. Young Pokemon make fun of Amistar, giving them beer and prodding about their past. Amistar have strong shells, and some say they're filled with valuable treasures that they've collected over their long lifetimes. Those are just empty rumors, though. They're not true. One time, an Amistar accidentally fell out of a 12th floor hotel window. Its shell broke open and everyone saw the only thing inside was old newspaper clippings, certificates of honor, and an excellence in combat and political training badge. No treasure. Number 140, Kabuto. These Pokemon suffer from constant misunderstandings. People ask, are you a Pokemon? Kabuto says, Kabuto. No, are you actually a real Pokemon or just something like a Pokemon? <clears throat> also, this is some more Russian wordplay that doesn't really work in English. Basically, Kabuto sounds like the Russian words Kakbudo, which means similar to or kind of like. So anyways, Kabuto screams, Kabuto. We don't have any use for a fake Pokemon, so what are you? Kabuto, Kabuto, it whimpers. They're generally peaceful. From above, they look like boulders, and below, they look like beetles. So they're kind of beetles and kind of boulders? That's probably why they call it Kabuto. Japanese people use them to build rock gardens. They find a flat spot, put down seven Kabuto, surround them with a fence, fill it with sand, then sit and admire them for hours. The Kabuto put up with it. They don't try to escape because they probably couldn't survive in the outside world anyways. 
Number 141, Kabutops. Kabuto turn into Kabutops very suddenly. Their shells burst open and out pops Kabutops. They look terrifying with sharp sights instead of hands and iron claws in place of legs. But they're actually very sophisticated Pokemon. They love nature and beautiful works of art. Their horrifying appearance was just a bit of bad luck. A lot of Kabutops give lectures about Renaissance artists. Their audience trembles with fear for the first half hour, then they get used to it. Eventually, they start laughing at Kabutops. Look, they say. It looks so scary, but it doesn't attack anyone or do anything weird. But you have to exercise some amount of caution. Kabutops' patience is long, but it's not infinite. One time in Chile, a crowd of screaming executors pissed off a Kabutops so bad, it cut off all of their heads. Number 142, Aerodactyl. You can find these handsome Pokemon in the resorts of Cyprus and Turkey, where they soar over sea-dragging tourists on parachutes. After they make enough money off the tourists, they go rogue. Aerodactyl use the money to buy weapons, then a dozen of them join forces to attack villages of Brazilian peasants and steal their bags of coffee. They load it all on their backs and fly to Europe to sell the coffee at a high price. But not every Aerodactyl turns to a life of crime. Some fly the straight and narrow their entire lives, giving tourists and children parachute rides and flying cargo around. But they have terrible reputations because so many are robbers, so even the nice ones sometimes get shot down with missiles. Number 143, Snorlax. Snorlax are like big haystacks who sleep in fields and next to lakes. Children jump on top of them, crows sit on their backs, and sometimes tractors run over them. But Snorlax just keeps on sleeping without a care in the world. They're incredibly smart and would make great scientists and writers, but unfortunately, they're too lazy. They don't care about anything. All they want to do is sleep. Sometimes they wake up, open their heavy eyelids, and sigh, saying, Nothing ever changes in this world. Then go right back to sleep. But once upon a time, they were still young and had hopes and dreams. Once Snorlax became a sumo wrestling champion, no one could push his half-ton weight off the mat. But he fell back asleep before he could accept his championship belt. Snorlax's long-suffering wife pounded her fists on his huge back, demanding he wake up. But he just kept on snoozing. Number 144, Articuno. Articuno are blue ice roosters, a rather unpleasant type. Braggarts and deceivers. They fly all over the world marrying doves. They have wives and children in every country. Articuno have cold hearts, cold hands, and cold wings. From top to bottom, all cold. They're very wise, but also terrible cheapskates. They won't even buy their children kinder surprises. They make good money, though, by charging people a fee to see their gorgeous tails, which they claim have the power to heal people's ailments. Their little children in different cities stare at the sky, hoping, wishing, is that Papa flying over? Meanwhile, Articuno's sitting on a fence somewhere in Saratov, letting his tail hang down so some sick old ladies can touch it and be healed. What a fraud. Number 145. Zapdos. Zapdos charges cell phones in Holland. That's their job. They sit on the streets in small booths, charging people's phones for a small fee. It's a boring job, so for fun, Zapdos likes to gather in flocks of 1,500, all connected to each other with their feet and wings for a total of 100,000 volts. If the Zapdos at the end of the chain touches anything with its beak, it'll cause a short circuit and a cloud of sparks. Zapdos loves pop singers. They always flock to their performances, sing along, dance, and participate in light shows. In America, sometimes Zapdos executes criminals if an electric chair isn't working. Number 146, Moltres. Moltres fly around on fire, looking like planes that got hit. Wherever they land, it causes fires. Farmers with water hoses follow them around, shouting swear words. Old women cross themselves, whispering, Fiery angel, might of the heavens. But Moltres aren't angels. They're just useless, although admittedly spectacular Pokemon. Like all birds, Moltres lay eggs, but they're immediately cooked by Moltres' flames and turned into boiled eggs. That makes it exceedingly difficult to breed them. So you need to spray Moltres with a hose before they lay their eggs. Then take the eggs to an incubator. 
Moltres chicks are already on fire when they're born. Scientists can't understand why because the eggs don't have any gas or kerosene inside. Moltres like to nest on top of fire towers. Number 147, Dratini. Dratini live in Italy, have Italian surnames, and are descended from the 50th richest families in Italy. Martini, Fellini, Dratini, there's a lot of them. Like other Italian millionaires, Dratini are all mafia bosses. But Dratini's mafias are small and only consist of Dratini, Charmillion, and a Sicilian guy named Giuseppe. All armed and extremely dangerous. These mafias rob trains and buses throughout Europe. Dratini lies across a railroad track to get a train to stop, then Giuseppe and Charmillion shake down the passengers. Then they jump on Dratini's back and ride off to casinos in Naples and Rome. Dratini are cheerful, always willing to help, and very reliable. Recently, they've been in talks with the Russian Mafia, headed by Zemei Gorinich. Um, by the way, that's a dragon from Russian folklore. Number 148, Dragonair. After a while, Dratini give up train robbing and get into politics. They've made the city of Strasbourg their home, and it suits them well. Dozens of them crawl through the Strasbourg streets. You'll get exhausted having to constantly step over them. Dragonair sit on committees and subcommittees, reading and writing out reports. Sometimes they go to Angola, Iraq, or Bosnia to check up on them and bring back beautiful green eyed snakes as souvenirs for their collectors. They also speak excellent French. If you know any Dragonair, you'll find it hard to believe they used to be the same Dratini who robbed trains and got thrown in prison. Dragonair are especially skilled at diplomatic schmoozing. They crawl from guest to guest, making small talk and gracefully holding glasses of champagne with their tails. Number 149, Dragonite. Only one out of every hundred Dragonair become Dragonite, a Pokemon of love and mercy. They can only reach their final stage if they realize before it's too late that their entire lives up till now were devoid of meaning. Dragonite are completely different to their younger selves. Instead of crawling, they walk on their hind legs and wings grow out of their backs. They're too small to fly with, but they signify holiness like an angel and their gazes become very meaningful and wise. Dragonite can serve as an example to us all, showing that even a meaningless life can change so long as there's a will to do so. Dragonite work with the disabled, Pokemon that were injured after especially intense battles. They cook for them, take them to the store, bathe the armless, and give wheelchairs to the legless. Dragonite are very strong and could win many battles, but they choose not to fight. Number 150, Mewtwo. Mewtwo, or Mewtwo, is an artificial Pokemon created in a laboratory. It was created from the little Pokemon Mew, then its strength and combat skills were upgraded using a computer. Mewtwo has the height of a basketball player, but doesn't weigh all that much. Instead of fingertips, it has the computer buttons Enter, Delete, and Backspace. It uses Enter to revive its enemies, and it uses Delete and Backspace to destroy them by pressing the buttons against their foreheads. Other Pokemon are all deathly afraid of Mewtwo because they don't understand how it works. When it's not battling, Mewtwo works as a computer salesman. It uses the Delete button to make a lot of its annoying customers disappear. So you should only interact with Mewtwo if you're serious about committing to a computer purchase. Number 151, Mew. Mew is frail and only capable of asking questions in a squeaky voice. The questions are stupid, but tricky to answer, like, why is the sun round? Why do Pokemon fight? Is it possible to kill a thought? Mew's always wagging its tail and thinking of questions. A lot of Pokemon find it annoying, especially stupid Rhyhorn and Rhydon, who'd like nothing more than to crush little old Mew. However, Mew believes in progress and righteousness and reminds everyone of its duty to Pokemon, which is basically just annoying them forever with questions that are impossible to answer. As a result, only patient Chansey and Clefairy can talk to it. Other Pokemon just pun it like a soccer ball, then Mew flies through the air screaming, What? Oh, what is the meaning of life? <sighs> okay, that finally brings us to the end of the original 151. But there were actually six more Pokemon. We mentioned earlier this Pokédex had several editions. We don't want to overcomplicate things talking about all the reprints and all that, but long story short, they originally planned to make a full Johto Pokédex, but only ended up publishing entries for the first six Johto Pokémon. So here they are, starting with number 152, Chikorita. 
Chikorita likes to follow the latest fashions and know everything about perfumes and cosmetics. Their favorite brand is Is Roche and they pour perfume all over themselves. Chikorita are professional intelligence officers. In other words, they're spies, especially in Latin America where they extract secrets from Argentinians and sell them to Uruguayans or vice versa. It doesn't really matter much to them so long as they're paid. Chikorita's attempts at spying in Europe didn't really work out because the only foreign language they speak is Spanish. Chikorita dance sexy sambas and rumbas for generals who are so enamored they become like obedient little bunnies for Chikorita and hand over all their secrets. They willingly unlock secret loot boxes and show Chikorita photographs of missiles that the Argentinian government bought from the Chinese. Number 153, Bayleaf. After Chikorita's identities are exposed, they turn into Bayleaf, changing their color, habits, and even their gender. In other words, they transform themselves, in a way, into young men. But they retain a lot of their girlish habits, like making eyes at people, wearing jewelry, and using lipstick. They inherited it all from Chikorita after she was captured by the Uruguay security services. Bayleaf never admit guilt, always deny everything and call themselves prisoners of conscience, even though they don't have any conscience to speak of. You can tell just by gazing into their shameless lying eyes. Eventually, they're set free, then they make their way to the Atlantic Ocean, where they use the leaves on their head as antenna to continue transmitting information. Number 154, Meganium. Meganium can be tracked and caught by the scent of their cologne in Bolivian rainforests, where they go on Goodwill missions for Colombian drug dealers. Goodwill is, after all, well paid. Meganium's massive size allows them to feel safe among the wild tribes in the Amazon. Sometimes the tribes even elect Meganium their chief and build nests for them made from eucalyptus branches and bring them mangoes. That doesn't last long though, because the United States intelligence agencies eventually catch Meganium and make them stand trial. Meganium trials always get a lot of press attention. They remind Meganium of their younger adventures as Chikorita and Bayleaf, but Meganium raises its hackles like a turkey and insists they're the legitimate leaders of the natives. In the twilight of their lives, they always end up spending their final days in prison. Number 155, Cyndaquil. Cyndaquil usually approach people sideways, slouching and looking pitiful, like they're in need of sympathy or some good advice. Then all of a sudden, they'll boldly ask, Wanna see how my back burns? Out of surprise, people say sure, then Cyndaquil sneezes twice and little yellow flames light up from their spines. Then they have the audacity to demand money for the performance, insisting they have the best backfires. If you're in Russia, you shouldn't pay any more than 10 rubles, and if you're abroad, you shouldn't pay anything. In China, Cyndaquil get fined for panhandling, and in Iran, they get deported for it. They are useful though for getting rid of mosquitoes. Number 156, Quilava. Quilava are proud, independent Pokemon with burning tails and torches on their heads who volunteer as soldiers for justice. Since justice is being fought for all across the world, Quilava can be found on any continent in any country under any flag. Usually they form into squads and drop from helicopters onto the base of separatists or mercenaries. Quilava burns through them all like napalm, but they're not as expensive as napalm. Recently, it's become fashionable to keep Quilava as house pets instead of cats. They're very entertaining, but their masters never get a moment of peace and quiet because they have to chase after Quilava with buckets of water wherever they go. If they run into the closet, you'll have to call the fire department. Also, all six Johto Pokemon use their official artwork, except for Typhlosion, which it seems just a random image was taken from the internet. Last but not least, number 157, Typhlosion. It's very easy to piss off a Typhlosion. If that happens, it'll explode like a landmine. Or at least that's what it looks like. Typhlosion literally disappears in a huge fireball. But if you wait around until the smoke clears, it'll still be there. But most people never get a chance to see it because their explosions are so huge. Every building within a 300 meter radius gets destroyed. And beyond that, there's another kilometer of broken glass and people injured so badly, they'll be deformed for the rest of their lives. Typhlosion are pretty scary Pokemon. People treat them nicely out of fear, feeding them popcorn, letting them sleep on rugs in their bedroom and catering to their every whim, especially in hot spots. But those morons still blow themselves up over the smallest of problems. 
just on a whim. Sometimes, several times in one day. It's very annoying. And that's it. That's the final entry. Not long after the Pokédex's first edition was published, the book's author and publisher got threatened with a lawsuit and the circulation got cut. But by then, they were already pretty widespread. As we noted at the beginning of this video, our Russian translator Annette told us, by this time, many children already had it. I asked friends and even those who were not into Pokémon surprisingly had it as a child. The Pokédex book was so popular that the publisher wanted to keep selling them, so to dodge copyright issues, they set up a fake publishing house called Pokémon Press and kept on printing them. Around the time Pokémon Go was at its height in 2016, the book was illegally reprinted once again, and was even sold in some of Russia's biggest bookstore chains. It'll probably get reprinted again someday, if it's not already happening as we speak. Almost half the Pokémon in this book have original artwork, but the rest just use their official art. We would have liked to get in touch with Dmitry Gorchev, the artist who made the Russian versions, to see if he'd made more, but sadly he passed away in 2010. We also wanted to interview the book's author Alexander Zhatinsky, not just about the art, we have so many questions we want to ask, but he died in 2012. A sad ending to a fun story. Dimitri, Alexander, we hope we did your book justice, and you would have liked the idea of it being shared with Pokemon fans around the world. <sighs> Rest in peace. If you've got 90 minutes to spare and want to see an official Pokédex book only released in Japan but now finally translated into English, click the video on screen. Or for more stories about how Red and Blue were different all around the world, click the other video. And if you would like to see Pokemon videos in not Russian, I've done a good amount of those. And if you have any other questions, uh, my name's Alpharad and I, I don't know, just Google me, <laughs> whatever you want to do. Once again, huge thanks to Annette Elvers who brought the Russian Pokédex to our attention, helped us get a copy, and did most of the translations over the past eight months. And thank you for watching. See you next time.